is worthy, makes the first man miss. Straight ahead past the 40. This is 365 Sports, powered by Sikkim365.com. Rattler on third and eight. Herman brings pressure, hit as he throws. Jump ball! What a catch! Xavier again. He is him! 365 Sports is presented by IdealMRI.com. High quality MRIs for $497 or less. IdealMRI.com. Your health is important, so is your budget. Second and 15, Mertz pumps. Over the middle, Pearsall. Touchdown, Gators! 365 Sports is also brought to you by Texas Farm Bureau Insurance, protecting Texans since 1952. If you subscribe to our YouTube channel, search 365 Sports on YouTube. Brought to you by TFNB, your bank for life. Benson, through a gaping hole, Benson kicked in the turbo. Good night. Touchdown Seminoles. 365 Sports is turbocharged by Unite Private Networks. Find out more at UnitePrivateNetworks.com. Here's David Smoke, Paul Catalina, and Craig Smoke. And here we go on a new week and a Monday. It's a week of the last of any of the conference tournaments to see if anyone will be playing in March Madness. Of course, there are numerous at-large berths, too. And the Big 12 tournament starts midweek in Kansas City. The women still with their semifinals and championship game to come. We're going to dig into a lot of basketball, a ton of it including the latest from Joe Lenardi with Bracketology. The Big 12 men's bracket uh, we will also get into the honors of the All-Big 12 team as far as the superlatives that were announced over the weekend, too. And a really, I thought, funny quote and uh, from Jamal Shedd, the All-American guard out of the University of Houston. Uh, there's also a coaching change imminent, it looks like, in men's basketball in the Big 12. All that and more. But let's start with the, how long have we heard that there's a deadline looming. Uh, Ross Dellinger with a great article on Friday. He's going to join us today at 420. A deadline looms. An agreement is absent. We know that the revenue sharing is still trying to be negotiated between the uh, four autonomy school uh, conferences, uh, the group of five, Notre Dame, et cetera. And uh, I saw the last percentage was 58% Big Ten SEC, 31% ACC and Big 12, and 11% Notre Dame and also a group of five. They got to bang that out. They need a revenue thing. They need to fix the format. Craig Smoke, Paul Catalina, we've heard the deadline. What is, what's going to happen if, in fact, somebody tells the power to to go ahead and leave? What do you think the reaction would be? I, I think right now, nothing. Uh, because I think at this point, the power to the Super 2, trademark Craig Smoke, 2022. Two, two. Say 2022. Yep. Uh, so 2022. Uh, I think right now they would not. I think actually that's the one of the things they can do to maybe keep them, like go ahead and do it, but there's no governance, there's no structure, there's no plan. So right now they would they would do it. The problem is if you do it and they say, okay, no, we're going to stay now, it doesn't mean they're not going to spend the next few years building that plan and leave eventually. I like While I know it would not be good, for everybody else, it at least would provide direction and clarity and would take that weapon out of the arsenal for the Super 2 to just say, well, if we don't like what, you know, if you don't give us everything we want, we're going to leave. If you don't give us everything we want, we're going to leave. And I do think that somebody needs to stand up and say, look, you want all these, you know, buys and or like all this stuff to be handed to you. If you really are the best two conferences, then it's just probably going to happen. And the years that it doesn't are going to be so rare that you won't even remember it. 
I mean, that, that's the other thing. They are trying to, to, I know it's all about money, but they're trying to ward off something that is going to be so unlikely to happen most years, given the size and depth and power of those conferences and the, the brands and the teams that they have in them and will have in them in the future because, let's face it, this is not over. They're not done growing. If that's the case, then what future are they guarding against? Where one year the Big Ten doesn't get four teams in? Oh, bummer. Like, all right, well, that's the breaks for 2029, 2030. They might get five. You have no idea. Yeah, I mean, we all know at this point it's greed driving everything. It's tribalism to a certain extent, too. At least uh, tribalism a lot when it comes to the arguments that you see of why they deserve to have more and why they deserve to always demand more and and this and that. You should be happy to just have a seat at the table. And I'll go back to what I said last week. It's come to a point now where you're basically making it seem as though you're going to get your way regardless. So capitulate to us. Let's go ahead and get our way so we can move on to the next thing as opposed to fight us. We eventually get our way and then we move on to the next thing. So yeah, I said last week, if you're the big 12, I know it's, it's very uncertain right now with the ACC. I mean, that's a big lever that hasn't been pulled just yet that we know could get pulled at some point. And, and when it does, it's going to shake things up. But you know, at some point, yeah, you have to just sit there and, and kind of draw a little bit of a line in the sand. I mean, you know, if you're uh, if if you're the Big Twelve, if you're the ACC. If you feel like the ACC is going to still be somewhat what it is or close to what it is in the years moving forward, um, you eventually have to yeah put your foot down a little bit. And if they decide, okay, well, you decided to fight back, we're going to brush you off and move past you anyways. Then then that's the breaks, but so that's the it. risk that you run because it's just again it goes goes back to to this. The money gap is already so large because the TV networks have determined that. And we know they're pulling strings behind the scenes. And it's not in their best interest or in their pocketbook's best interest to sit there and throw a bunch of money at the Big 12 so that it's all even. So there's already that disparity. But when you start getting into what some of the demands seem to be with the college football playoff, that grows even more substantially to the point of you're having like a 70 to $80 million advantage over the teams that you're competing against on quote-unquote equal ground. So at a certain point, if you're Oklahoma State or you're Baylor or you're TCU or whoever, yeah, you want to keep up with the the quote-unquote Joneses or whatever, but at some point you have to look at what's best for us. And is what's best for us sitting there trying to just go into the red constantly to just keep up when there's an $80 million or whatever the figure is, tens of millions of dollar advantage from schools that couldn't even sniff our jockstrap in most sports, but they have this monetary advantage, not to mention the ones that – have tons of other built-in advantages over us, are we going to sit there and really try to pretend that we can keep pace and stress ourselves over trying to scratch every single dollar out? Or do we eventually just go, all right, you guys go do whatever you're going to do. We're going to pay our players the best we can, but we can't afford to pay them all like an NFL team. So y'all go do that thing that y'all are clearly planning and trying to do that you don't really want us to be a part of, and we'll go do our thing that hopefully is um, – you know, consistent not only with college football, but also does have some of the new elements to it, such as paying players. But we can't pay like Ohio State pays. We can't even pay now like Rutgers pays because the TV deals and the potential playoff payments are so extraordinarily different. So, you know, that's where I come from on this. For one, I hope that the playoff discussion uh, by the end of the week or, or here pretty soon just ceases. Like, can the playoff committee just go away for a while so we can talk about spring ball and other things? Because we've been hearing about you guys a lot, and I understand why here lately. But at some point, y'all don't need to be a year-round sport. Y'all need to go back to your little official designations with your universities and go do that for a while, and then let's reconvene because we've been hearing way too much from you guys, and I get it. But soon, we need to not hear anything from y'all for a little while. So... That's kind of touching on everything there. But, yeah, I, I think the question for the Big 12 and some ACC members, and, again, it's, it's so hard to even kind of peg them because we don't know what that's going to be, but is a breakoff going to substantially hurt you to where you're not making anywhere near what you would be making if you were to still go and abide by this playoff the way that the Big 10 and the SEC wanted? Does that make sense? Yeah, like, yeah. If you're going to make $40 million per school in this new setup that's clearly – arranged to favor one side significantly. And I understand they have the most ratings and the biggest schools and all that, but it is a very unbalanced, you know, matchup here. If that's still better than what you would get otherwise, then maybe you just have to bite the bullet and go through with that. But if there is an alternative 
where you just throw your hands up and you say, look, we want to pay our players too, but we're not making the same money you guys are making. We got to go and do it a different way. Then, then that's what you have to weigh, and I think that's what the Big 12 and others are probably weighing right now. All right, according to Ross, and he'll join us at 420, Adam Rittenberg, ESPN, today at 3.30, and uh, also his story last week about the most intriguing quarterback competitions, et cetera, uh, coming up in 2024. So if, in fact, as of now, 60, uh, 58% of $1.3 billion, this is, again, floating out there, discussions, negotiations, it could be also a little bit of speculation. $1.3 billion annually. And the way that would be split up is the Big Ten and the SEC would get 58% of that. The Big 12 and the ACC would get 31%. And then the others, again, would get about 11 Notre Dame and group of five. What that would be approximately, if that percentage worked, is this enough to say that they're separating themselves even further? Because right now, based on the new te- 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 television revenue, et cetera, there is probably a 25 to $40 million gap that's about to be there, if not already. The uh, SEC would get each team $23 million apiece. The Big Ten, $21 million. Why would they take less than the SEC? Uh, numbers of teams, I don't know. ACC, 13.7. Big 12, results. 12.3. And group of five teams around $2 million apiece. $2 million apiece is what they would share Uh, based on, as Craig just mentioned, and also the number, the figure that's out there. Um, I I, I have, we're going to have some ADs. We've already had Chris Pesman was on Friday. Uh, We've had Jamie Pollard. And the question is, what is the number in which you should walk away? What is the number? They're in Kansas City, the Big 12, ADs, presidents, or whoever's there, Brett Yormark and his staff too, because the women's tournament is about to converge with the men's tournament. What would be the number that you walk away and say no? Because on top of the $23 million each for the SEC or 21 for the Big 10, does not include the increments of the units that you also can add by the numbers of teams that you're trying to at least say we should get three or four. Right, so if you get four and all of a sudden you've got already now double of the payout of what the other conference has on top of the payout, so playoff shit that's already higher. So could end up being 40. On top of yep. the television yes. disparity that there already is, which is like, I mean, it's as big as it's probably ever been, no? With the new yeah, contracts that are be, rolling yeah, in? Yeah, yeah. yeah so absolutely. So you add up the, the TV money disparity, and I get it. Hey, you have... More teams, bigger markets, bigger populations, bigger crowds. Not debating that, not arguing against that. And Ohio State deserves more money than an Iowa State for television. I don't think we'll argue that. Now, when you go top to bottom and you start throwing in other schools, and you know that's when you get into other arguments. But between the television disparity, the playoff disparity, the number of teams that you add into that, especially when you're already trying to rig it up to where you're automatically going to have an extra team in, if not a couple extra teams in, that's that's a that's a growing gap, boys. I mean, that's that's paying for that's enough money to pay for an entire team like five times over, all scholarships and everybody with hundreds of thousands of dollars compared to a school that's already smaller that doesn't have any of those advantages that you already have trying to do the same thing and pay their guys the same and hold and it's just it's like what what sport are we the, playing here? There's also no way to make it up. That's right. that's where the Florida State argument comes in. And what they're trying to do with the ACC is, I'm sure they would be like, look, we'd be fine if you guys, if we had a way to make this up, to say, okay, they've renegotiated this, they've done this, we've got this, what gives us an opportunity to do this? There's no way to do it. There are zero ways to do it outside of blowing up a conference and hoping for the best for each individual team. And that's not really a good plan either. Like, that, that is just playing into the monster even more. And I I just like, what do you do? Like if you are, if you're a school like Washington state, if you're a school, like even a school that's in the other two autonomy conferences. Now, if you're one of those schools, how do you just make up that money? You can't do it because if it was there for you, you'd already have it. The only way you could make up increments of it is if you make a deep run with multiple teams in the college football playoff, if you're not put behind the eight ball before but, the thing even but, starts. But even, yeah, but here's the thing. That's just, you said increments of it. Before the season starts, no matter how crappy a team may be, 
Alabama can go 14 and 0 or 0 and 14. They're still going to have more money than Clemson before it starts. Bottom line. And also, if you are the Big 12 or let's say the a- ACC, um, yeah, go make that run. The other conferences are going to have twice as many teams as you, so they'll have, you know, like, I mean, based on some of what was being floated out there, they're trying to have double the participants automatically just based on affiliation. So they get more cracks at it. They want more money, a automatic chunk, and also yeah. more teams more, automatically. More than you are. So, you're, are, again, it's another thing where the route to go and get that money – you're still at a disadvantage because you're outnumbered and you're dealing with schools that have way more of everything than you do. So yeah, it's, it's rigged to where that's nearly impossible to do as well. Like the run of a TCU. And I said this last year with the expanded playoff as a fan, I love it as a fan of a school who I think can manage this way through that. Yeah. I I feel fine about it. If I was a fan of a school that's not as well equipped as a, as an Oklahoma as a Texas, a Michigan name mall, or even some of the just the schools like a, you know, a Mississippi State's more well equipped than sure. than a far more successful brand than in most other conferences, just because they're in a league that pays out a lot of money. I mean, you're already dealing with that, but now, hey, this school is going to make um, like twenty million dollars more than you per year, not because they're any good, but just because they happen to be at a good place at the right place in history uh, when leagues were being formed. They don't win as many games as you. They don't even invest as much, but they just, they just make more money. And they're going to have that to spend on a roster, and they're going to have a much easier time trying to navigate a playoff where now you might have to win up to four games mm-hmm. because they can pay their players and they can retain them and do that. So you're not only battling that, but now if you're in Oklahoma State or a Texas Tech or whoever, all of these things that we've already mentioned that you're dealing with, um, the gap's only grown wider and now you're asking them to go have to win another couple of games on top of the disadvantage they were already facing in a four-team playoff in, in the NIL era. So it's asking a lot, and that's, that's your only route is to, to go out and win, and normally that would be just the answer, and that really is the only answer right now, but you're asking them to go and win and do so at an extreme disadvantage when it comes to personnel and being able to have all the bells and whistles that a lot of your opponents will have who are automatically already at an advantage. So, yeah, it's a, it's a frustrating puzzle to try and figure out if you're Brett Yormark or uh, the ACC folks who are, again, dealing with their own set of, of other very unique issues. And so that's why I just don't know what your answer would be right now, and that's why I'm sure there's a lot of great and interesting conversations happening because – is that still the meal that you have to sit there and swallow because the alternative isn't even better? Because well, what is the alternative, you know? And so that's that's the the dilemma that you have right now if you're uh, not an SEC or a Big Ten school. Paul, how many teams in the ACC before the new ones are added? 14? Yeah. And now they're going to add Stanford, Cal, and SMU. Yeah. So they'll have 17 teams. Yeah. Okay. Which means by adding those three, remember, they're not all going to get – the full share, we've been through that. SMU negotiated that with the ACC. But also, the more teams you have, and everybody seems to be at, what, 16 or plus now, if you get, for example, the Big 12 will have 16 with the new four and losing two. So they'll have 16 teams. The ACC is going to have to split their money over 17 teams, which, again, very, 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 very minimal. The units that you get by... Making the college football playoff, first of all, is between three and will be approximately three to five million each. And then every time you advance, approximately three to five million every week or every round. So if you have four teams get in, there's another 20 million. If you have one team get in, there's maybe five million. Is there a scenario? Is there a scenario in any circumstance where the Big 12 is getting four teams in? Uh, Under absolutely not. Under a uh, one of those just like all the planets lined up and somehow or another, but mo- well, the, the, the I mean, I'm the talking best, about the once best five maybe QB. in 25 years. Yeah. They're going to have to have one of the best league years ever to just match what others get automatically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and then based on uh, like the, the top five quarterbacks in the Big Ten will all have to get hurt. Like that kind of a thing <laughs> right, like yeah. that where like everybody but, you know, gets again, hurt. You and know, listen, and- let's also look at it the other way around. If you have the clout and you have the yeah. leverage and you have the logos and you have the – the attendance, the enrollments, the stadium size, and you are the alpha, most people, most businesses I know are going to try to take advantage of that. Oh, yeah, no, it's it's America. We're not saying the SEC and Big 12 or Big 10 
are stupid. What we're saying is, is that how much can you let if your ACC, Big 12, Group of Five, whoever, Notre Dame, how much more can you give up before you just can't keep well, that, up? And that, that's where it is. Like, are you, are you concerned about the ecosystem of college athletics and college football? Are you concerned about the ecosystem for the two of you, which is... Greg Sankey the, has said many times, the ecosystem of college football. Yes, but... That is, you got to make your actions say that and say, okay, well, this, you know, we would like to have, you know, more automa automatic buys and all that stuff, but also realize that, you know what, you're like, I know you're trying to get that money, but it, you'll get it most years anyway. And you're not going to be like, in the year that the SEC would only get three teams instead of the four they wanted. Like, are they going to be like, oh, crap, we got to shut down the league because yeah. we didn't get that extra Well, who's going to say that at no. two years into it, the couple of the bigger super twos? Um, maybe they, I don't like the way this is going. This isn't what we want. And then they try to force another hand. Yeah, I just, All of that. We're going to hear from Adam. We'll hear from uh, Ross Dellinger on it, but this is the week that you, you would think as Craig said, figure it out, lock them in a room. My God, can we go into something else besides this? Although it's great for us and for you and for fans, at the same time, it can wear your ass and be numbing down. Yeah, we just spent uh, like a couple years on the yeah. uh, expanded playoff, and now they've got us onto the next chapter, and they have to get it done this week. Like, it, you know, everything's like a suddenly, like it has to be done. It's like, didn't y'all just have the last thing had to get done then? So I guess now this thing has to get done now. And, and okay, well, can we get to a point where you get everything done? And so, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a, Again, I keep using the word dilemma because I think that's what you're facing as the uh, ACC and the Big 12 of do you call a bluff or do you accept what may be the better offer even though it puts you at extreme disadvantages that are going to be hard to overcome in any way, shape, or form minus going on a run and having multiple teams win national titles, which is going to be harder than it was ever uh, before because of the disadvantages that you face financially and the path to the actual playoff now. So um, that's that's why Brett Yormark and Jim Phillips and other folks get paid big money to figure those problems out. So again, I imagine those conversations happen at the basketball tournament are very interesting. And like, to your point about the SEC and Big Ten, I, I don't fault them at all. Like, nope. I mean, it is what it is. Like, you know, you're at the top of the food chain, the apex predator, then, you know, you are going to gobble up uh, – you know, pray. And I guess in some ways, the Big 12 or the ACC or just the college football ecosystem uh, is is very vulnerable. And there's, you know, some prey out there that maybe they're still wanting to hunt and and take care of. And, and maybe they want the Big 12 to call their bluff. That's the thing that we don't know with the, the, the hands being dealt right now. Maybe that's exactly what they want to hear. They go, all right, you know, you've seen this. We tried. We gave it our best effort. Everybody knows that's BS. Everybody knows their try is very half-hearted, but they can still say we tried and they decided to go and pick, take their ball and go home. Um, or is there actually a real threat if the Big 12 or the ACC was to say, no, no, we're not going to do it this way. And then maybe you sit down and, and you – you know, have some different types of conversations. It's it's hard to know. Greg Sankey talks in, like, riddles now at this point. Have y'all noticed that? He's, yeah. like, very cryptic, and he's, like, I mean, I know he's, like, a big book reader and all that, but I've just come across more of his tweets here lately, and it's he's trying to do the whole Twitter thing of being very cryptic sometimes, which is hard to, to figure out, but I guess that's the intent is, is to be that way. So, yeah, who knows what, what he's thinking or what the Big Ten is thinking, but they hold most of the cards, if not all the cards, and – um, I think we all knew that this was on the horizon. I saw a comment of, like, basically, uh, you know, the Big 12 waving the white flag. I don't think it's that. I think it's just trying to figure out where you fit in. Like, nobody's giving up, but, you know, at some point you have to acknowledge the – it's like, okay, if you're two guys trying to fight a 1,000, did you give up or did you just, like – were you smart and just realized, like, hey, we want to still be alive, so we're not going to go straight into our deaths here. I think that's what the Big 12 is trying to figure out. It's not giving up. It's saying, is our future better at a major disadvantage, bigger than it's ever been, but still a part of the playoff? Or would we be better off with more like-minded teams under a slightly different system where we're all playing – in the same sort of a ballpark, and there's not a $60 million gap. I mean, that's what you, again, have to figure out, and that's what those main conversations, I think, boil down to. So um, that's a, a fascinating, a continuing storyline that I guess is going to have some sense of getting wrapped up this week uh, to some extent. If you look at the numbers and you do percentages of 58% or 52%, the amount of money 
is uh, very, very small. The big number, for example, the 58 percent, what was it, uh, 700 and some million. Um, and the if you go to 52 percent, it's like 700,000. Uh, so, um, uh, excuse me, 52 percent of the pie, if the SEC and the, eight, and the Big Ten did that, would be like 702,000. That doesn't mean they're going to do that. They're right now, at least the number that Ross has reported and a couple of others, is 58 percent. We need to break because Adam Rittenberg from ESPN on a couple of notes, the one we just discussed, the topic, and his thoughts, and um, we keep hearing about this deadline. What is the actual deadline? Trying to figure that out for you as they're all trying to gather up and try to figure out what moves forward with the college football playoff now and also when they move to 14 teams because that's just a matter of time. This is 365 Sports. Dr. Kent Petty. Petty Clinic, LowT.com. Dr. Petty can help you become the high-performance man you want to be, need to be, used to be. And here is how. If you have symptomatic issues of low testosterone, ED, sex drive, not the same, energy's not good, you're not sleeping well, you've gained weight, but yet you're pretty active, it could be your testosterone within your body. This is for men. And it's one out of every three to four men who have symptomatic issues of low testosterone. It happens. It's part of father time. And so if that is hits you. If you're in that like one out of every three to four men, contact Dr. Petty and his staff by going to the website, Petty Clinic Low T, and there's an email, there's a phone number, either way you want to connect them, uh, contact them, and they will then set you up for you to go get your blood work. They'll take care of that appointment for you. You give your blood, they get the results in Dr. Petty. If in fact you fall in line with one of every three to four men, with low testosterone can put you in a program to increase it so you can become the high-performance man you want to be, need to be, and used to be. Dr. Kent Petty, his staff at Petty Clinic, LowT.com. Rev up your excitement. Celebrate the spirit of adventure during the Jeep Celebration event. Join us at Alan Samuels in Waco as we roll out incredible deals on rugged and reliable Jeep vehicles you love. Seize the moment and drive home in the new Jeep of your dreams. With special financing options and exclusive offers, there has never been a better time to explore the world of Jeep. Hurry in. The savings won't last long. Visit AlanSamuelsDCJ.com and see them firsthand only at Alan Samuels in Waco. Let your adventure begin. Come by. Let's be friends. Stepping into the boots of a U.S. Army officer can add confidence and leadership skills to your son or daughter's career path. See all the things they can achieve in our boots at GoArmy.com. U.S. Army Waco Recruiting Company, 254-598-8131 or 254-776-1543. At Ideal MRI, we feel blessed to be part of the Waco community. We're a small family business here in Central Texas. At times like this, the cost of health care has never been more important. And unfortunately, significant illnesses and injuries still occur. And that's why Ideal MRI is open and here to serve you through this difficult time. So if you need an MRI, ask your doctor about Ideal MRI. You can schedule online in minutes at IdealMRI.com or call 833-IDEAL-MRI. Johnson Realtors guide you seamlessly through the process of buying your dream home or selling your current one, commercial, farm and ranch, or residential. Camille Johnson Realtors can smoothly and successfully lead you through any transaction with a team of 28 experienced agents who are excited about serving you. Camille Johnson Realtors services the entire greater Waco area. If you're in the market to buy or sell, contact Camille Johnson Realtors, 104 Midway Center in Woodway, or find them online at www.camillejohnson.com. Camille Johnson Realtors, elegant, charming, Warm. Welcome home. Parenting is full of surprises. You never know what to expect. So after our son was born, I called my Texas Farm Bureau insurance agent to set up a life insurance policy in case something happened to me. Sawyer is now two. And we'll soon have a sister. There's no one else I would trust with protecting my family. Stop by and see our agents at one of our three McLennan County locations. Coverage and discounts are subject to qualifications and policy terms and may vary by situation. Baylor alumni are more than 160,000 strong. When we all join hands to support our university, we don't just move the needle, we move mountains. Working together, we create life-changing opportunities for students on the field, in the classroom, in the laboratory, and in life for generations to come. So get connected. 
Get involved. Learn how at baylor.edu slash alumni. Let the journey to financial brilliance begin with Genco's limited time offers. Max your earnings with a Kasasa Cash account and get paid monthly with a 4.25 APY. That's $425 annually. Then invest in a 13-month share certificate and earn 4.9 APY. That's $529. Earn cash and outshine the rest. At Genco, we offer you the sun and the moon. Kasasa based on average daily balance of $10,000. Certificate based on $10,000 investment. See GencoFCU.org for details. NCUA. This is 365 Sports. The 3 o'clock hour is sponsored by Waco Custom Marketplace. Meats, sweets, Texas treats, and a cut above the rest. 425 Lake Air Drive, Waco. Adam Rittenberg of ESPN. We will get to a story about the intriguing quarterback changes in college football headed up to the 2024 season and more. Adam has joined us many times. We always appreciate his time. Adam, with the college football playoff, and I almost cringe when I bring it up because there's this imposed or self-imposed ESPN wants to know because of their deal, and then so does everybody else on how many teams get in, how much money. How much do you really think there's a give and take here? And like with any negotiations, they'll end up with everybody being happy when they finalize the revenue sharing. Right. I, I don't know if anyone will be completely happy, but I think there needs to be, you know, more of a spirit of, of working together. Um, look at what's gone on in the sport over the last 10 years. I know that, you know, talking to folks that were more involved in those conversations in the past, I think there was, you know, still a, hey, we're going to, we're going to negotiate hard and we're going to argue at times, but we're still, you know, somewhat aligned in, in our pursuits. And I don't know if that's, you know, necessarily the case any longer after what's gone on in the landscape. But, you know, I, I, it seems like the Big Ten and SEC are certainly working together more than they ever have, um, you know, with, with these two commissioners. But is everyone going to be happy? You know, I, I don't think completely happy, but I, I would hope that, that people can at least be um, somewhat uh, okay with whatever they decide. And to your point, there needs to be some urgency here. Do you think that... Greg Sankey has the, and, and Tony Petiti now, have the greater good of the college football ecosystem um, in their in their bullseye, like they want that, or is that just something that would, if it works out for everybody, that's fine, but they're really only concerned about the, the two of them? Well, I mean, was, I sat down with Tony about a month ago, and he said, listen, you know, my, my, my responsibility is to, is to this league, and that, 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 that's what you're hired for, and that has to be top of mind. Um, but you know, you can know, kind of in Greg Sankey's defense, you know, he did come up with the 12 team system along with the other commissioners, um, which could have been in place already by now. Uh, and you, you know, did so with the, with the feeling of, you know, this playoff needs to nationalize. It can't just be the same teams. And, you know, he was very upfront about saying that, you know, the current system, the 14 system obviously served the SEC better than any other league. They're winning a national championship. You know, pretty much every year with different teams, other than the, the, the Clemson years. Um, so, you know, I, I think there it's there to a degree, but is it is it really there? I, I, I don't know. I, I think that um, it's just become a very greedy environment, um, and uh, and obviously those two conferences you know, ha- have that ability to be greedy because of who's in those leagues. Adam, can you, for especially the folks who aren't, you know, talking about this kind of stuff every day, who maybe are just brushing by, wondering why there's a sense of urgency, a sense of urgency, explain why, especially when a brand new playoff just got passed like a couple weeks ago, right? And here we are, and there's another sense of urgency. So, can you kind of lay that out for everybody? Yeah. So, so basically, the the new system goes into place while the f- first contract is ending. So, you know, instead of having you know new system, new contract. Uh, you know, the new system is going place into place in year 11. However, the, the, the media contract expires after year 12. So that's why there's, you know, a negotiation for, you know, what the playoff is going to look like um, in format, in structure, and obviously in revenue distribution for 2026 and beyond, um, you know, with, with, uh, with obviously, you know, different elements to that. But that, that's why this is going on now because, there obviously needs to be planning, especially if the playoff is going to expand, um, you know, and, and other things for the 2026 season and beyond. Adam, uh, one other thing on that. It, it, 
right now there's a I've seen reported multiple people 58 percent the two big uh, conferences 31 percent for the Big 12 ACC and like 11 percent Notre Dame and group of five and the differences of like a percentage or two could be a thousand hundred thousand dollars or so what would you think happen if in fact the Big 12 and the ACC said listen we need to know our future too this is where we stop you make your decision so that we can make our decision of what we do. How you think it'll ever get to that point where they would have the balls to do that? It would be very interesting. You know, I, I think especially from the Big 12 perspective, because you know, the Big 12 has been an aggressor. Um, you know, the Big 12 is a huge reason why the Pac-12 doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and, it, it, you know, it, it obviously reaps the benefits of that conference. The ACC, ACC is in a little bit different position because, you know, you have a, a notable member of your league that is that is publicly trying to leave mm-hmm. in Florida State. You have others who are watching what happens with Florida State, uh, and you know, very anxious to see if they're successful. And if they are, you know, they're you're probably going to pursue similar means. And so, uh, I, you know, again, I, I think it would be interesting to see how aligned those leagues are in doing what you're saying, or or anything to sort of push back against the big two who are now you know, again, communicating in a different way than they ever have, um, at least since I've been covering the sport. But it, it would be interesting if those leagues do you know, stand up and say, you know, this is it. This is what we're willing to do. And again, I, I'm in favor, you know, I wanted a national playoff all, or an expanded playoff rather all along to have true national representation. An expanded playoff is not about having more teams that can actually win the national championship. It just isn't. You can, you can delude yourself into thinking that, uh, and it's great to have teams that feel like they have a chance, but more than, more than likely the same teams are going to win the national championship. What, what a playoff should do in any sport, uh, you know, college or pro, is have enough inclusiveness. And so my, my hope is that whatever they decide, uh, there will still have you know, enough representation from you know, all the conferences that really matter and all the teams that, that really deserve to be part of it. But let, let's not kid ourselves about who's going to win this thing most years. Mm-hmm. Good point. Good point. Adam, you wrote the uh, column last week uh, about the most intriguing quarterback battles, and um, you, the first one you listed was Ohio State, and I would assume that most people don't think this is going to be a quarterback battle because they went and brought in Will Howard, and they have this kind of silly depth when it comes to the freshman that they have coming in and the battle that they're going to have down the line. Uh, what is it about Devin Brown that makes you think that he, he may have more than a puncher's chance in, in this thing? Well, I think you have so many different variables. I mean, Will Howard, it's a new place. It's a new system. You have Chip Kelly now as the offensive coordinator uh, working with Ryan Day uh, and, and what he wants to do. Um, and then you have Devin Brown, who's a guy who really pushed um, Kyle McCord throughout the offseason. And you know, Ohio State, if you guys remember, you know, didn't really declare a, a starting quarterback as soon as it wanted to and, and kind of let it spill into the season before Kyle McCord was, was, was labeled quarterback one for them. So – I, you know, again, I, I think it'll probably be Will Howard. Uh, that's certainly what he, wh- why he went there was to, was to be the starter for a team like Ohio State, which is kind of in a national championship or bust situation. But, you know, Devin Brown, he, he came out recently with some comments pushing back against the thought that he was going to transfer or give up. And I, I know they like him. You know, last year, you know, being at their, one of their first practices of the fall, you know, they were running uh, first, you know, high level offenses on, bo- two, on, 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 on parallel fields because they wanted to get, Devin Brown as many reps as Kyle McCord. So I, I think they still like him. They're going to give him a chance. And, and serve, you know, not only Tip Kelly, but you know, Julian Sayan now uh, joining the mix along with Aaron Nolan. There's just a lot of quarterbacks, a lot of talent in that room right now to, to sort through for Ryan Day and Tip Kelly. You have TCU, of course, as a part of the Big 12 with uh, Hoover, who had a chance to play a lot last year because of some of the injuries to Morris. Seals, who's a Vanderbilt transfer. Haney. Uh, and, and more, so you think that's somewhat wide open? Do you feel like Hoover, because of the experience, is the right one? Well, I think Hoover, you know, certainly goes into the off season as the favorite. Uh, you know, as, as does any you know one who who started for the team the year before. But it wasn't like they had a great season. Mm-hmm. And Seals is a guy who has experience. You know, with a, with a, a team that, that has a lot of disadvantages. Now you put him in, in a TCU offense with with how they play and some of the talent around him. You know, maybe he accelerates his development uh you know again there was uh, you know a couple off seasons ago it was Chandler Morris and then all of a sudden Max Duggan ends up taking them to a national championship game so the TCU's had some interesting quarterback situations involved here 
Um, but I think overall in the Big 12, there's not a lot of drama. But so I wanted to find one in the Big 12, and at least that one, you, you know, seems like it has a chance to to have a little mystery there with, with Seals entering the mix. Which teams do you think are really looking at this uh, spring transfer window um, thirstily? Maybe Auburn, um, teams like that. Yeah, I think Auburn's really interesting because you know Peyton Thorne comes in from Michigan State as a multi-year starter. You know, didn't have the type of production that they were hoping for. You know, they know they need to get better on offense. It was a big reason why you know, Hugh Freeze made the coordinator change and, and got rid of Philip Montgomery after one year. And I think he's going to be more directly involved in the offense. So if they don't see what they need to from, from Thorne or the other candidates, I think they're going to be active in, in, the, in the spring portal. And then you look at Michigan. You know, it was Michigan, it, you look at who they have coming back, and I know Jack Tuttle just got another year of eligibility – but um, there's really no experience, significant experience uh, in that quarterback room. So are you going to turn it over to a guy like Alex Orgy, who came in more as a, a change-up quarterback um, and ran the ball but didn't attempt to pass last year? Or do you have to uh, go into the portal and find someone who, who has uh, you know, a little more experience, who can feel more secure, especially with all the changes going on? And they, ha- they have a new coordinator. Even though Kirk Campbell was the quarterback coach last year, now he's the play caller. He comes more from the Joe Moorhead school of offense than, than really the Jim Harbaugh school. So how does he blend those two philosophies together? And what type of quarterback does he ultimately want? Is it someone that was in his room last year? Or is it going to be somebody from the outside who they can bring in? So I think the, the defending champion could, could be one to watch in the, in the spring portal. Adam, as you point out, a lot of the attention now is on transfer quarterbacks and you know big time seniors who are moving over for uh, last year before going off the NFL. But in Lincoln, that's not the case. I mean, all the buzz about uh, young Dylan Rayola, uh, you seem to not have much hesitancy in, in pegging him as the the guy in Lincoln, uh, which makes sense. But can you just kind of break down why? Yeah, well, again, you, you talk about transfers. This is a team that, that went under five hundred last year and chose not to add a transfer. So to me, that says. They are making it about as easy as possible for, for Dylan Rayola, the true freshman who flipped from Georgia, number one overall recruit, to, to, to be the guy. And, um, it, you know, again, it would be surprising, I think, if, if he isn't the, the quarterback entering the fall, even though, you know, he, he's just now, you know, a few months enrolled in college there. Harburg is back, and, you know, he obviously played uh, at times last year, but I think in terms of talent and potential, uh, if you're not starting the clock on Dylan Rayola, uh, coming off of a five and seven season, what what are you really doing there in Lincoln? So you know, you know, could I wouldn't completely rule them out if they don't like what they see from him or the others. Would, would Nebraska be aggressive in the portal in the spring? It, it's certainly possible, but I, I think it's lining up to have uh, Rayola be the guy here as a true freshman. Adam, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it. Adam Rittenberg, ESPN dot com, with the story. The most intriguing, college football's most intriguing quarterback situations this spring. And also quite a bit, of course, when it comes to the college football playoff. 12 for the next two years, possibly or most likely 14 at least in three years. ESPN wanting to know, how will they, uh, uh, how's this all going to be split up? What about the format? What are they going to do? Are they going to sublicense or sublicense? What would be sublease? Some of the games to other networks. A lot to be done, and I don't know why it takes time, but then again, when you see strikes, they always have a deadline eventually that's the real one, and most of the time, things get done. Well, it's one thing when you got like an eight, ten-person boardroom, and you've got, in <laughs> yeah. this case, dozens of people with their own agendas to try and all land on the same page. So I know I asked a pretty obvious question for most of this audience about why is there this sense of urgency, but there are new fans, and there are people who aren't, you know, necessarily diving into the deep end on every topic all the time. So I just wanted to kind of let him set the stage for that and uh, remind everybody of why are we talking another playoff already when we just passed this new one? Well, there, there's the reason why is because of the the various issues he laid out. But yeah, I mean, uh, in a fun article, it's a typical offseason article to read is about, you know, quarterback battles and new faces and things like that. And I'm excited that spring ball is going to be here very soon, if not kind of getting started uh, around the country now. No, we're less than a week out from spring ball kicking off over here. So uh, very excited about having some of that to talk about as well. And uh, some of these new quarterback faces, uh, Riley Leonard in, in, uh, in South Bend or Dylan Rayola in Lincoln. And it's going to be a lot of fun to, to see who the big splashes are, who the misses are, and 
uh, just kind of what the storylines are that develop around that. So, yeah, some on the field to counteract some of the off the field will be very nice in my book, but uh, definitely there will still be, I think, probably more attention being paid to the uh, to the uh, off the field stuff just because of the stakes there. And, you know, I was saying for the, the Big 12, they need to figure out, or the ACC, although, again, they have an asterisk because they have, like, undetermined business, right? They've got unfinished business with some of their schools now, and so they're not exactly operating as a league that just knows what they are and knows what they're going to be moving forward, unlike the Big 12, which has a pretty, pretty good grasp on that. But you're sitting here weighing – you know, the disadvantages versus the opportunity. And I think if you're the Big Ten and the SEC, uh, are you sitting there going, okay, well, if we were to eliminate everybody uh, and you're you're palling up with ESPN and NBC and, and everybody else that you're partnered up with, okay, we, we eliminate everybody and we just go have our own thing. I'm sure they're sitting there weighing the odds of, all right, what does that rating look like? Is it going to be the same? Is it going to go up? Is it going to be drastic if all of a sudden we basically just kick a bunch of fan bases to the curb? Or are they going to be a bunch of suckers and they're just going to keep watching us anyways? I think that's the kind of debate on the other side of the equation that is probably going on to some extent, regardless of what they think of the current ecosystem. Uh, and how much do you think that would be? You know, I mean, because Ohio State, Michigan is still going to pull in 10 plus million, regardless of whether Iowa State's got access to the playoff. But over time, are people just going to sit there and, well, and eat that, okay, or are they going to get if, disenchanted? If there's a separation of 32 to 40 whatever teams, then you wonder how much of that $1.3 billion is there and how much of it's left that would go towards – if there's another level of competition. Yeah. By the way, on the deadline, because we've heard it, we've read it, we've seen it, we've discussed it. I've heard Bill Hancock mention it. I've heard, I've read articles where they've talked about the deadline. I just heard from Brett Daniels. He is the basically the uh, spokesperson for um, the college football playoff. He's not on the committee, not Bill Hancock. But he's very much involved. He's been the media relations people uh, person when it comes to Olympic Games, worked for the Cowboys for a long time. I just asked him, what is the deadline? No firm deadline right now, just sooner rather than later. So any thoughts that it might be this week, or at least the thought of it maybe needing to be at this week, could end up being at the end of March, could end up being then. But so there's no like March 15th. There's no March 23rd. Uh, no May 1st. So that's from Brett Daniels, who is the media contact and relations director of the college football playoff. Here we go. All right. A couple of things to get to. Our guest lineup today also includes Ashley Hodge at 445 on the Big 12 tournament opening up in Kansas City. The men here very soon. The women are now Iowa State's in the championship game, uh, and they await the winner of tonight's semifinal game. Also today, we'll hear from King McClure. ESPN college basketball analyst, his take on the teams that he thinks right now, is there a small group? Is it a group of five to eight to 12 teams that he feel like can win a national title? His thoughts about the Big 12 too. And we will also hear from Ross Dellinger at 420. And this is 365 Sports. Ideal MRI in the Central Texas marketplace where they can help you with two important things. One, uh, what is hurting you? Your doctor, you've been to the doctor. You may have been to the doctor multiple times. Your back is a problem. They want to see an image of your lower back, your vertebrae, or maybe it's upper part of your neck, your shoulder. Something is bothering you and it hurts. And it's kind of, you know where it is. Could be like your knee, your shoulder, your back. Ideal MRI has a state-of-the-art technology MRI machine that will find out evidence the imaging that you need, the imaging that your doctor needs. I have been inside that machine three different times, and by the end of the day, I have had Dr. Maxi and others who have called me or contacted me or sent me the images and put it up in the portal for my doctor to see, whether it's been my lower back or whether it's been something else. Ideal MRI, $497 or less. Every single time the average MRI is $1,100, you can do the math, and you can get the result and the evidence you need, and so can your doctor, and move forward with some sort of a way to feel better, idealmri.com. 
With so many companies and policies out there, it gets so confusing shopping for insurance, and I never know if I'm getting the policy that's right for me. Luckily, I met the team at the Niche Group Insurance Agency. With the Niche Group, you can go to one company and get access to coverage options from many insurance carriers, and you get to speak to a real person about your specific coverage needs. With the Niche Group, I know I'm getting the right coverage at the right price. If you need insurance, talk to the experts at the Niche Group at 1-800-258-8302. Don Humidor, you're home with a 48-foot walk-in humidor with the elite cigar brands from around the world, including the number one cigar of the year, Aging Room, Quattro Nicaragua. Plus, they have the great brands like Macanudo and Artur Fuente, Rocky Patel, Aston, and so much more. CBD, great for sore muscles, aches and pains, sleep, Vita Dreams and anxiety, mild depression, general health and wellness. Their staff, very knowledgeable on the subject. If anyone is curious about CBD, ask Carolyn Ashley, Don Schumanor in the Townwood Shopping Center off Valley Mills in Waco. Baylor Scott & White Southwest Sports Medicine and Orthopedics, the team physicians for Baylor Athletics, diagnosing and treating all sports-related injuries, including concussions. These specialists also provide orthopedic services for athletes and non-athletes alike. Whether it's knee or shoulder pain, a wrist injury, orthopedic spine care, and even an arthritis and total joint clinic. Trust the doctors Baylor Athletics trust. Baylor Scott & White Southwest Sports Medicine and Orthopedics wants to get you back in the game. Waco Custom Marketplace is your hometown grocery store with a full-service butcher shop and bakery. Hi, this is David Smoke. The butcher shop can take your customized orders for seafood, pork, and poultry and custom cut your favorite steaks from bacon wrap fillets, sirloin steaks, bone-in ribeyes, boneless ribeyes, and even prime rib. Cut specifically the way you want, the thickness that you want. They're all delicious. They have Norwegian salmon, mahi-mahi, catfish fillets, sliced ham or turkey, variety of cheese, and several options of sausage links, and even regular jalapeno or cheese snack sticks, fresh chicken breast or whole chickens, sliced bacon, pork chops, and ground beef, marinated beef or chicken fajitas, and always large briskets and tri-tip available, plus fresh vegetables. So the great product, customer service, and tradition continues at Waco Custom Marketplace, a full-service butcher shop and bakery, open Monday through Saturday. The Bauer Family, Waco Custom Marketplace, 425 Lake Air Drive in Waco, or WacoCustomMarketplace.com. This is 365 Sports. Text us at 254-339-1122. The text line is sponsored by Riverbend Liquor and Wine with the most extensive variety of craft beer in Waco. A hidden gem on Lakeshore Drive and 19th Street. 365 Sports, Craig Smoke, Paul Catalina. I'm David Smoke in the studio with us as always. Garrett Ross, Jack McKenzie, Emery Winter, and Levi Carraway, of course, doing a lot of what we do every day. The Sports Tonight, 365 Sports Tonight, every night, every weeknight at 1030 on the local CW presented by GXG. So let's do some basketball here. And in about an hour, Ashley Hodge looks at the Big 12, and then an hour and a half or so later on, we'll have King McClure look at all of college basketball. Here are – here's the top 25 poll that was released. This is uh, – you know, now they're in the conference tournaments. Houston, very close to unanimous this week. Baylor, 14. Iowa State dropped just a ticket, 7. Then Kansas lost and got, they got uh, road graded by Houston Saturday. Kansas, 16. There's BYU steady at like 20. Texas Tech moves into the top 25. Had the win against Baylor. What a crazy game. Up, what was it, 16 and early in the second half. Down with seven minutes to go. And then they won on the barrage of three threes in a row. Two possessions where it was an and one. And ended up winning, coasting down the stretch. So there we are. Plus there's Arizona. They were beaten over the weekend by, I think, USC. They're at six as another future Big 12 team. There we are with that. What does all that mean? Nothing, really. Because the top 25 does not set the bracket. Here is Joe Lenardi's bracketology. Where he sees everything as this particular time. It would be in the Big 12. Houston would be a one seed. Iowa State, a two seed. Baylor, a three seed. Kansas would be a four seed. The other number one seeds, Purdue, Tennessee, 
and UConn. That's pretty salty. Yeah, uh, I and and I don't know if you look at conference tournaments this week. I don't know how much is going to shake up based on that um, because you know the 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 schedule's kind of already been played, especially the way that most teams schedule out now. So yeah, I I, I don't know how much that's going to change. Houston definitely. A number one seed, that's not going to change. Um, if Iowa State did manage to win the tournament, though, I would I would be curious to see if they no, would push that no, a little bit. But because when they lost, they dropped from a two to a three, and Baylor yeah. moved into a two. Mm -hmm. So they've got some they've got some uh, blemishes yeah. that apparently. Well, of the course, way that this lost is to put Kansas together. State by yeah. double digits. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess so. I think you could see Tennessee's the last of the number one seeds. They have been flipping back and forth. Arizona's been in there. And North Carolina, who had the nice win against Duke, has been in there. So I don't know if, if they are. But Kentucky beat them. Kentucky's a three seed, so we're not going to be able to jump from a three seed to a number one seed. There won't be as much movement as you think unless you get to the next part of it, which is your last four buys, the last four in, the first four out, and the next four out. That is where you can get things that can kind of go haywire. I saw where Indiana State, one hell of a team, got beat. And now they have to wait to see if they're going to be an at-large team. There you see the multi-bid conferences. There's a bunch of them with nine, at least for now. And that's what Lenardi told us, or no, Jerry Palm told us about a week ago. Now, the Big 12 men's tournament will start in Kansas City. The women wrap it up in the next two days. There's the tournament. You have some teams with double buys. Baylor, Iowa State, Houston, and Tech. Tech was a great win for Grant McCaslin and company. Ended up 11-7 and seven in the conference. Four teams have double buys waiting for other teams to play. And there you have, of course, the way the bracket is set up. Yeah, I like the, I like the, uh, the intrigue of now having, you know, uh, five days of a tournament, you know, two or six days of a tournament, Tuesday through Saturday. Um, you know, Tuesday is still probably going to be kind of a day where, yeah, it, it is what it is. But when you get into Wednesday and you've got teams uh, with buys, teams without buys, and then a couple teams that get to wait, uh, four teams that get to wait three days before they play and kind of rest up and, and have to play a team possibly that's played twice before them. So, you know, um, you know, whoever, if Oklahoma State, or or UCF beats BYU and then Tech's just sitting there with two days and they've they've got a, a team that's already played twice. Uh, that's going to be interesting to see how that works and it's probably different team to team. But yeah, this is interesting. I also think I've got a theory on the Big Twelve tournament in Kansas City. I want to float by you guys. I think uh, media days is the first thing that's going to start floating and then it's going to start applying to conference tournaments and any even football. But I think this tournament's when the Kansas City contract is up is going to find its way for a year to New York. Why do you say that? Because I think Brett Yormark loves it. And I think he likes moving things around. And I think he thinks that that's going to help grow I the brand. I thought they just extended it to like 28 the, or something. They, like they did. But I do think – but I think that gives him time. That gives him, what, four years yeah. to – to build up to he that point. He wants to do the Barclays Center, right? It, oh, I Madison think he would Square Garden, do. One of the two, yeah. yeah. I will, the Madison Square Garden, he uh, quite often hosts the you ACC know, or somebody else. So. This is not to be flippant, but Kansas, Kansas State and Iowa State fans will go, what? We've got to get in an airplane to go to the tournament? And by the way, Kansas City does an incredible job hosting the tournament, but I could see that possibly down the road. Yeah, this is not the same Big 12 uh, membership-wise that it was, and I know that they get a lot of the attendance and, and rightfully – you know, wanted to stay there because they bring such great attendance. But, you know, it is like having a home game for them in comparison to some of the others uh, automatically. So there is that uh, advantage that you also want to grab hold and, and, and keep holding on to if you're those teams. So there is an element of, like, an, an advantage to it that is part of your argument. You're just not, like, emphasizing that so much. No, we bring all the fans. Well, yeah, you bring in the fans because it's close to home, and so you have that opportunity now you inevitably hear, well, Dallas used to host it and Dallas sucked. Well, Dallas doesn't have to be the spot. No one's saying it needs to be Dallas, but there can be other places, especially when you have a league that is going to be close to coast to coast, uh, just based on what we know about it looking like next year, much less whatever it looks like in a couple years, whether that's with just the four pack additions and it stays put or whether there's more additions or more subtractions, we don't really know. But yeah, I think at some point you open that up and look at it again. And especially when you've added teams from all over 
that uh, aren't necessarily keen on you know going to Kansas City. So it's been nice to have. They'll continue to have it. But yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they decide to, to shop it around here in the next few years. And I don't think there'd be anything wrong with that. Um, meanwhile, I think uh, just first thoughts that that come into play when it comes to that bracket is TC Oklahoma is a big game because whoever wins is likely to get in. They're in that win and end spot, uh, according to a lot of the bracketology that I've seen. So that's a very important game. And winner gets to go play Houston. So congratulations. You're probably booking your spot in the tournament, which is you know the main thing. But then you're going to turn right around and face some absolute killers from, uh, from U of H who, man, really put an exclamation point in the regular season this past weekend with their – utter demolition and uh, left no doubts. Uh, so congrats to Kelvin Sampson and the Cougs on a very, uh, you know, worthwhile emphatic. and entertaining and emphatic and impressive uh, first year in Big 12 men's hoops because uh, they left no doubts. And that's a team that's definitely competing for a natty. But yeah, next week in Kansas City or what this week, I guess, mm-hmm. in Kansas City uh, should be a lot of fun. It, All right. It, uh, it was weird to me to see the, the women's tournament start before yeah. again. But now they have to because they've got to get they've got so many teams and moving parts and and all that. It's going to get only bigger next year. But it did remind me of the year. At least there's going to be less lead time away from it. But there was a year where they played the Big Twelve Women's Tournament or all the women's tournaments like a full two weeks before they got in the tournament and they just sat there. Yeah. You know, for yeah, a couple did. weeks. And I, I I don't think it did anything for you know, building excitement for the women's tournament. They also played at the sure. alternative arena, too. Yeah. If you'll remember. Mm-hmm. Now, by the way, congratulations to Texas Tech. The men won the indoor track and field national title. Wes Kitley, their head coach, is a legend, and they did it. Congratulations. And Kim Coulter put a super chat for me to mention it. I didn't need that, but appreciate it, Kim. Uh, The Natty Indoor National Championship for Texas Tech. And what a weekend it was. Also on Saturday night, they got the win against Baylor with Coach McCaslin. Now, here are the players, like the superlatives in the Big 12. No doubt, Jamal Shedd, the player of the year. There were thoughts, perhaps, at some point, was it McCullough, was it Dickinson? They had injuries. But no, no one, no one was better. Uh, start to finish. And here's the thing about Jamal Shedd. He was also the defensive player of the year. Point guard, the leader, hit clutch shots. Jamal Shedd, two of those are superlatives. Jacoby Walter, who really played well on Saturday against Texas Tech, can light it up. At times, you wonder where he is. But the freshman of the year from Baylor. Hunter Dickinson, the newcomer of the year. And, of course, that award in the last three to four years has changed dramatically because of all the transfer portal. And you think, oh, wait a minute, he's – but that, he is newcomer of the year. BYU, Robinson. I watched him, Jackson Robinson. I love the way he plays. Sixth man of the year, best player off the bench. Kelvin Sampson. This could have gone to TJ at Iowa State, Utzenberger. It could have gone to Grant McCaslin. But, man, Sampson grabbed that thing by the horn after, what, two start, two losses early in the conference – they were the best team, start to finish, and he wins coach of the year. Yeah, and, you know, I think the first two games, it was like, oh, all right, well, this is how the other half lives. You get to see it, Houston. Now you're in a, a big boy conference, and it was like they needed to, like, pass that through their system, and then they only lost one of their game uh, on the way out uh, in the conference. They were fantastic uh, all year long, and their D, like, even in some of the games they lost, they didn't look, they didn't look bad. Like, you know, you, you watch them and like, yeah, okay, this team played really well today. They beat another team that was playing well. He has got that team, and he's been building it for a while, humming right now. And that's as what he said in the, the post game too. This yeah. isn't something I mean, we're just now not, doing. Yeah. yeah, this wasn't just they, they got in the Big 12 and they got their, they got their juice. They, they've been building it for a while. They played was, Baylor in the Final Four in 21. Yeah. yeah, he was ready to be in this league probably four years ago, honestly, uh, but really ready now that they had like enough time to go, okay, yeah, we're going to be in the league. You can recruit guys to the league. The portal he's been fantastic with. You know, look, took a player off of Baylor's roster that, I mean, I don't know if Baylor's that much different this year if they have LJ Cry or not, but it was a benefit for them. And 
It, well, it, he's, every, he would have been better than a couple of their guards, but it, it might have yeah. not had one yeah. of the two that did come in. But yeah, he, I don't, he, I, like again, I don't know if their record's totally different. Yeah, you know, if, if he's here or not. He, he had a great year. Yeah, uh, he was second team, I think, all Big Twelve. And then Dylan DeSue, the big man from Texas who went down, has been bothered by uh, uh, his leg, but uh, Texas with a nice win against Oklahoma jumped on them early to win their last game of the Big 12, and Dylan DeSue, the most improved player. I thought at the end of last year he was their best player, but even improved even more as he is the most improved player in the Big 12. Yeah, um, he also should be the most deceptively athletic human being that's ever, I mean, I mean, he looks like a baby giraffe, but somehow he moves really fast, and I... Uh, I enjoy watching him play, and it's going to be tough for Texas, you know, in the tournament, which I think they will, in fact, get in unless they just completely what you the NCAA. They're, yeah, they're in. That, that, I mean, that's like, not even. That's yeah, I don't not think it's a question, question. Now, but like they they're in. But um, but I think it's going to be rough for them if he's not going to be available or completely healthy. Yeah, I mean they're they're definitely in. I think it's just they're a puzzle as far as what version of Texas you're going to get. I mean they could go make a run to the Sweet 16, or they could fall in the round of 64. For all we know, that's that's the thing that is hard to really peg with them. Last year made the run to the Elite Eight, remember? Yeah. So I mean they're they're still talented. Uh, it's just a matter of can they put it all together at the right time. And uh, yeah, I mean congrats to to everybody uh, for the accolades here, Houston heavy as it should be. Um, thought. Uh, very cool to see Jacoby Walter have the year that he have and has had, and we'll see what he's able to do uh, here in the rest of March, uh, how he's able to further etch his name into the, the Baylor books because who knows? I mean, he's a guy we probably are calling his name in the draft this summer, and that's just kind of the norm around here now is, is having those one-and-done type of guys. But he's definitely, as advertised, I feel like, talent-wise, and uh, been a lot of fun to watch. Uh, and, yeah, I, I get the argument for T.J. Otzelberger – you know, as far as coach of the year goes, especially if you're an Iowa State fan. But, I mean, come on now. It's, it's Kelvin Sampson's. That's a no-brainer. Yeah. I mean, with what they did coming into the league, dominating the way that they have, just so impressive. Congrats to Houston. That's huge. I know there's been little milestones along the way this first year in the Big 12, but that's definitely the biggest one up to this point. And, hey, go win the rest of it. Uh, or go, you know, somebody else from the league. Somebody go win the rest of it and really prove that you're the best league in the country. But I think you're feeling pretty good about the chances that happen. And with a team like Houston – playing the way that they uh, are right now. So, yeah, uh, don't don't really have a lot to pick apart with that list and and definitely uh, am looking forward to this week in Kansas City where there should be some incredible matchups. And, and going back to Tech real quick with that uh, national championship, um, congrats to, to the program. That's They've got indoor and outdoor uh, national championships now at this point because uh, they won the indoor back in 24. I mean, uh, the uh, outdoor back in 19, and now they've got the indoor, so that's – the, the clean sweep on the men's side of things here in the last five seasons for Wes Kitley, whose son is the OC uh, yep. for Joey McGuire there in the Red Raiders. So, yeah, that's a big deal anytime you win a natty. And uh, congratulations. Not a surprise with how successful that program's been, but still that's a first, and that's a big first to, to, win, a, to win a national championship. So that's a big deal. All right, one note from Jamal Shedd. He was asked about – this is uh, from Joseph Duarte, who does a great job covering Houston – he was asked, what's the worst thing that Kelvin Sampson has ever told him? He said to me, I'm, you're softer than a puppy blank in the rain. That hurt my feelings. He was calling me soft. Yes, that's what puppy poop in the rain would be. And so Joseph Duarte with that quote from Jamal Shedd. It's like soft serve ice cream in the, in the, in the rain as well. Like the Dairy <laughs> Queen dip? Cole? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Here's one more from Joseph, and then we break. Come back with Ross Dellinger. Last week... We just showed you the AP Top 25 for this week about five minutes ago. Here are the teams in the Top 25 from last week alone who were, who were beaten. Look at the list. That is competition. That's depth. That's crazy. And so that was last week. It's probably going to happen again this week. And then we'll see what happens along the way as those are the teams that were beaten once and some twice in the last week among the AP Top 25. We will have a little bit of news later on, the NFL tampering, uh, illegal tampering, free agency going the on. dumbest name of anything. What, legal tampering? It's just call it free agency. The f deals are official on Wednesday. It's free agency. It's legal tamp. No. College football calls it the transfer portal. They yeah. Call it recruiting. Yeah, like, and there's a window, right? <laughs> you mean, can't do it. Uh, right? like, just call it free agency. Take yep. away the legal tampering thing. Yeah. All right. When we come back, Ross Dellinger 
on college football. Uh, you know, we, we have heard there's a deadline. I was told there's really not, but of course they could always make one. We will see in what does Ross have today that he maybe did not have on Friday or even over the weekend. David Smoke and Paul Catalina. Craig Smoke, uh, this is 365 Sports. Waco Custom Marketplace, 425 Lake Air Drive in Waco, Butcher Shop and Bakery, full-service butcher shop, full-service bakery, beef, pork, poultry, and seafood in the butcher shop, and the bakery, fresh-baked bread every day, fresh-baked halachis every day, and whatever they might have left, they will put them in a bag, have them in the freezer if you want to go by and grab a bag of 10, 15, maybe I think even one I saw might be 25 or more, and then you cook them, heat them up as you want. Also, there's uh, canned goods, uh, pasta, chips, marinades, seasoning, spices. Uh, they have brisket and, of course, tri-tip. There's a bucket of uh, like a trough with all sorts of huge brisket. You can reach in there and pick one out, the one that you want. And, of course, fresh vegetables, too. It's Waco Custom Marketplace. Brian Bauer and the Bauer family, 425 Lake Air Drive in Waco. Car's price right, day and night. Average your car in Texas. Trucks will feel red, white, and blue. Average your car in Texas. Cars that zoom with lots of room. Average your car in Texas. Count on us, a dealer to trust. Average your car in Waco, Texas. Established in 2007 and independently owned, Alliance Bank Central Texas is committed to helping families and businesses meet their financial goals. From their tellers to their board of directors, they know the importance of superior service and competitive products. Customers have confidence knowing that their financial needs are in good hands. It's your bank, Alliance Bank Central Texas, with two Waco locations, 4721 Bosque Boulevard and 191 Archway Drive on Highway 84 and at AllianceBankTexas.com. Member FDI see an equal housing lender. Developed by Startup Waco, a nonprofit organization, GXG is a program designed to support the entrepreneurial development of Baylor University student athletes through NIL activations. The program helps student athletes maximize their platforms and offers a comprehensive support system for them to create and grow new businesses that not only benefit themselves, but also uplift the local economy. Fans who wish to support student athletes can donate to GXG via the GXG NIL fund baylorbears.com slash gxg contributions to support nil activations through gxg can be made at baylorbears.com slash gxg for more information follow at gxg underscore green x gold on social media and visit the official website www.gxg.startupwaco.com gxg empowering student athlete entrepreneurship and uplifting the local economy through NIL activations. Riverbend Liquor and Wine now has two locations to serve you. The original on Lakeshore Drive and North 19th Street and the brand new spot in downtown Waco at 600 Franklin Avenue. If you're looking for the best in craft beers or local Texas bourbons, then the original is the place to be. And for the latest trends and online phenomenons, head downtown to the Franklin location. Either way, you're going to get the same great variety, customer service, and speedy experience. Check out both locations on their Facebook and Instagram pages. Riverbend Liquor and Wine, Lakeshore Drive and North 19th Street, and now now downtown on Franklin Avenue. This is 365 Sports, powered by Sikkim365.com. The 4 o'clock hour is sponsored by Boozer's Jewelers, the wedding ring store, specializing in custom jewelry and repair, all in-house. Now, here's David Smoke, Paul Catalina, and Craig Smoke. We'll have Ross Dellinger, Yahoo Sports momentarily. I did see this note. Former Arizona State and Notre Dame quarterback Drew Pine telling ESPN over the weekend that he's headed to Missouri. Has uh, three years left of eligibility. That story from... Pete Thamel and ESPN. Oh, I can sleep now. Thank God. That's long national nightmares. Well, over. here's no. another thing. It's his third team. 
We yeah. have that number, that's, right? That's the new number. Is That's how many teams you play for on average now in college football. It seems that way, at least, especially with, with quarterbacks. that You play at least for three teams, yeah. It's like the average quarterback – um, yeah, the attrition is three teams. Like Ross Dellinger. Left-handed relievers in baseball. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Ross Dellinger, Yahoo Sports, who has been all over the college football playoff, the revenue, the, the format, and much more, and everything else college sports, too. Uh, Ross, thanks for your time. So um, I reached out to Rhett Daniels of the college football playoff, the media relations, and I said, so what is the actual deadline? He's telling me there's not really a deadline, but sooner rather than later – so is this going to be like a union strike in the company and you need an actual deadline, or is it always going to be just kicked down the road? <laughs> well, they, they have – I think they have set uh, kind of, as I wrote on, in Friday's story, kind of an internal deadline, whether that's because of ESPN um, or not. I don't, I don't really know. I do know that ESPN was made it fairly clear um, – to the CFP that they'd like a decision and or an extension uh, and, and an acceptance of their offer that has been on the table for, I think, more than a month um, now. Uh, so they'd like they'd like uh, some kind of deal done, and so they haven't they have set an internal deadline. The CFP had for the end of the week this week. Uh, there's supposed to be a couple calls at the end of the week, and I think the the hope was that they would have a resolution, but lots of deadlines over the last three years lots of deadlines have been set in the cfp is blown right through them so i i would uh, wouldn't be hopeful ross uh, i keep uh, reading this term uh that uh is in a lot of your columns uh it's socializing uh that they kind of float out terms um like the automatic buys for the sec and big 10 no matter what uh, that one kind of went over like Wendy's charging more for Baconators at 6 p.m. than they will at 3 p.m. Uh, is that kind of the methodology they're doing to get a PR buzz on what things could be? And and if there's any backlash, like flood out the idea and see if see if it sticks, because I would have thought you would need to socialize that bias thing at all to know that most people wouldn't be in favor of it. Yeah, well, that, this is what happens with uh, kind of the process usually is, is you uh, – you know, you have weeks of days, if not weeks or months of, of meetings, uh, the CFP commissioners, and um, then they they often kind of uh, filter out uh, and meet with their athletic directors and or executive councils, which usually is an athletic director and a couple presidents, and they pitch the plan, um, and, and and that's kind of like, and they get they get feedback, uh, and that's kind of what's. What happened last week, I think it was going on this week as well. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I, I think that these are all negotiating terms and ploys. Um, you know, you've got Big Ten and SEC on one side, and you've got Big 12, ACC kind of on another. And the group of us probably kind of caught in the middle uh, in a lot of ways, just uh, some of them just happy to kind of be there and, and have a, have access. Uh, and so it's really, this is a, a deal among the power four. And I think what happens is, uh, SEC big 10 floats something out like the original plan, the original proposal of four, four AQs for each of them, right. Which was shot down and then the guaranteed buy, which was shot down and pretty roundly, um, uh, good, you know, criticized, uh, in the public uh, sphere as well. And now that's kind of, as we wrote, wrote on Friday, that's just kind of been tabled a little bit. Uh, in, in general, the format has been tabled. You know, this discussion uh, is about revenue and, and money and the revenue share and how you distribute money. Uh, and, and that's what they need to get done first. Uh, they got to get that agreement done. And then they would move on to getting the ESPN deal done. And then I think the last thing here is the format, actually. That could come weeks from now uh, they could agree on a format eventually and then whatever format they agree on it could change through conference realignment as well so it could it could eventually change but all the focus right now i think is on this revenue distribution model it, it is being socialized it'll be it'll be socialized more this week at conference basketball tournaments a lot of times commissioners at, at these tournaments meet um with their ad's uh, I believe they're in the Big 12. They'll have a mm -hmm. meeting, uh, I believe, on uh, Tuesday and Wednesday 
with, with athletic directors and, and uh, Commissioner Brett Yormark. Ross, how much have some of these talks been complicated, if at all, by the uncertainty in the ACC? Well, that that is certainly uh, something to consider. Uh, I, I think that as we, I wrote in that uh, story on Friday about the revenue distribution, the impact that this specific revenue distribution model could have on realignment and on on specifically the ACC. And I think there's some concern that there, yes, that, that there will be uh, some continuous shuffling in that conference and movement in general across the national landscape. And it's probably why, at least right now, in the proposal that's being circulated, uh, you've got you've got a look in provision if conference real if there is some realignment that happens, uh, you'll have a look in to the contract where things can be changed. Uh, revenue sharing uh, model in the format could be changed. So I'm sure that's in there um, largely because of the uh, uh, instability uh, in the ACC. Ross, in the NFL, which is the most powerful league in the world, uh, other than perhaps the European, what, what they have in soccer, even though the Cowboys are as valuable, more valuable than anybody else, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, or whoever, they have equal revenue sharing. So when the NFL contract is split up among 32 teams, Cincinnati gets the same amount as Dallas. Dallas can make more money on the side because they're the Cowboys of their logo and brand. College football getting away from even understanding if the most powerful league can do that? Why can't they? Well, I, I, you know, I think that uh, that is dying in college athletics. Um, we've seen it on, on a lot of levels. You know, we've seen for years now, the NCAA, and when I say the NCAA, I mean the entire membership of the schools that uh, have representatives on these on these committees that make the rules. They have for years uh, tried to legislate competitive equity, um, and it, it's that's beginning to break. We, we've seen that kind of break under the really under the under the weight of of increasing revenues at the highest level. Um, I think there are programs that make a lot of money, whether it's the top 30 or top 50 or even top 70, and uh, they make a lot of money. They make enough money to be able to spend that money in ways they want, and they want to keep the money that they make uh, or, the, or the value that they bring. And, and that's what we're seeing. We've seen that on the national level at the NCAA, um, how they've deregulated a lot of rules to the conferences and such, and they've stopped um, in a lot of ways, they've stopped regulating competitive equity. And now we're starting to see it at the conference level. And now what we're talking about here, we're starting to see it at the CFP level, um, where you have the uneven distribution of revenue and the unequal format when it comes to access for, for playoff as well. Uh, you can certainly argue that those things are not good for the industry as a whole, but I think members in the SEC and members in the Big Ten would argue that they spend more, they make more, and so they want more. And that's that's kind of the argument. And again, I, I think that there is a very good argument to be made that that is not uh, in the best interest of everyone. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, thinking about me right now in I guess America in general, but certainly as filtered down into college athletics. Ross, they are um, when you try to make rules with automatic qualifiers for any league, uh, you do limit the number of, of total teams you can get because now you've got to fill all these other ones out. Uh, also. Um, wouldn't you just be like, if you're doing all the automatic qualifiers, aren't you like guarding against a, a future that, that may be kind of like a one-off every few years where the SEC may only have three teams to get in or the Big Ten may only have two teams to get in? It would just be one kind of really weird bad year, and then it would go back to where you're probably getting four each each year anyway. Like, I, I don't... I don't understand why they want to guard against that other than just to make sure they keep that money when they could maybe make more of it by not having automatic qualifiers. Well, you know, I think 
one of the things why you see the multiple automatic qualifiers uh, circulating out there in these models is to remove, I know from the big tin side, they feel this way, is to, to remove as much as they can the authority and subjectivity of a selection committee. Uh, so they want it to be more like, you know, pro sports in the NFL where you, you have a certain amount from a division in the NFL's case or a conference in college case uh, of teams make it uh, in the top of the standings. So I think, number one, it, it, it would eliminate some of the uh, subjectivity with the selection committee. I, you know, I number two, I, I think that they want their regular season, both SEC and Big Ten, to, to be as valuable as possible. Um, they want to play big games. I think a lot of them want to get away from playing the G5 non-conference game or FCS non-conference game, actually. I think they are moving away from that. And in order to do that, you know, you have to play bigger games and you're risking losses. And so you want, you know, a certain amount of uh, your standings, your top, top of your your standings to get in automatically and not have to, you know, worry about uh, thinking about scheduling a two or three buy games to, to get those victories. Uh, I, you know, so that's, that's another part of this. And then there's, you know, there's, there's certainly plenty of ways to, to have a playoff format in, in college. And, um, you know, one of them you know, we have right now, which is the selection committee pretty much does it all. And, um, you know, or you have a certain number of, automatic qualifiers but back to the revenue for a second there's a ton of ways you could do the revenue differently and i'm not exactly sure why they haven't chose to do the revenue distribution more on performance based uh than automatic like they're they're doing now in a way they're doing automatic qualifiers for the revenue Mm -hmm. you know 58 percent of the revenue going to the SEC and Big Ten and 32% basically going to the Big 12 and ACC is a fairly huge gap. And I know they got, they obtained that gap or they obtained those numbers. They used the previous 10 years of CFP participation by conference when you consider the realignment moves. And this is what they came up with. I think 72, 72% of the field the last 10 years was made up of Big Ten and SEC. So they kind of used that to determine these base distributions for the CFP, but the, to me, right, the, the, uh, the more, there's another way to do this, and that is to do it based on performance. If you get a team in, then you get a certain amount, and they do that now, but it only is responsible for a very small amount of the distribution, $100 million of the $1.3 billion is performance-based. And I don't know. I, I kind of feel like that that should be more, and a lot, a lot of people uh, would agree. Ross, where do you think the, the health stands right now in terms of conference championship games, given the expanded format and just kind of the desires of various leagues? Yeah, I, I think it depends on, on the exact format, right? Um, if you, you know, I think there are three formats kind of floating around right now. Um, we reported on that one about a week and a half ago where you have three automatic qualifiers for each, the Big Ten and SEC, two for the Big 12 and ACC, one for the G5, and then you have three at large. So there's that one. And then there's one, I think, that's 2-2, two, 1-1, two, one, one, one G5, and then seven at large. And then there's a five plus nine, uh, which is kind of like the five plus seven we have. We have five automatic qualifiers of the five highest ranked conference champions, and then you have uh, nine at larges uh you know, it depends if you if you if the format is the latter, where it's five highest ranked conference champions get AQs and seven at large, well, conference championship games mean a, a ton, right? You get the AQ if you win. If it's the first one I mentioned, the three three two two, then conference championship games, I can almost assure you, will not exist in their current form if that's the model because they are somewhat irrelevant uh, to the whole thing. Uh, if it's the 2 2 one, one, you know, the ACC and the Big 12, your conference champion would be get the AQ, so it, it still does mean something. There's no doubt that conference championship games 
in the future of them in college football, even if it's a 5-9 or 5-7 as it is for the next two years, probably will be reevaluated in, in a lot of leagues. Now, the SEC and Big Ten make a lot of money on their conference championship games. And I would guess they would work hard to keep them or keep a version of them, even if it's like the third or fourth team playing for a spot or, or something like that. Um, but, you know, I wrote a story back in December actually analyzing this issue because I heard some buzz that there are conferences that uh, are ex- at least believe that they should examine whether they should have a championship game or not. Um, so if we have a 5 9 five, seven, probably more likely they stay around a little longer. Um, in any, anything else, any other version, the 3-3, three, 2-2, three, two, two, the 2-2, two, two, one, one, I think you'll, you'll have a real hard time uh, keeping conference championship games for very much longer. Ross, it, there's a quote in your article, would the power to really leave if we say no? Is there a number that you have heard, a percentage right now, it's 31 point whatever percent for the Big 12 ACC. Is there a number that they would put up there and say, this is what we want? And I know this negotiation, but is there a number where they would say, screw you, you guys do your thing. We need to figure out our own future. We're going to move on. And then where would their money come from? Would that be part of the $1.3 billion because everything changes? Well, yeah. I mean, everything, if there's some kind of split, right, everything changes. Uh, and it, 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 it's hard for me to see that happening and the Big Ten and SEC going off and, you know, doing, having their own playoff. Um, and maybe, I don't know, there could be some other leagues in the G5 that even opt in to their playoff. Um, but if the Big 12 and ACC are going to hold out, man, that really complicates things. You only have 34 schools um, in mm-hmm. the Big 10 SEC. And that is just a really small group. Um, and and, and you got to think about your TV partner in ESPN, potentially Fox at some point. Uh, you, you know, you've explained in the playoff now, 12, 14 teams. So would a, would a, 12, a 14, let's say a 14-team playoff, um, that incorporates all of FBS. Uh, it, it, in this version, everybody stays together. Uh, will be worth 1.3 billion. What would a 18, let's say six or 18 playoff in a in a 34 team Big Ten and SEC combo thing? What would that generate? Probably not 1.3 billion, but probably pretty close. I'm guessing. I'm guessing it would be it would be close. And they know it would be close uh, to that number. But I don't know that ESPN, who has a stake in the Big 12, Mm -hmm. it has a stake in several group of five conferences, and has certainly has a stake in the ACC, they've got sole rights there, would want a split to happen. Um, I just don't, uh, I don't, I don't buy it. I I, I think that uh, they would push back ESPN so much on that, I would imagine. Well, Ross, one more thing. When the Big Ten and the SEC are already making and their new TV deals that whenever they start will be making, I don't know, what is it, between 25 and 40 or so million dollars a year more per school. Then on top of that, they're going to make an extra 10 or what, 15 million over the, the ACC in, in the Big 12 per school if this 58, 31, whatever. How much is, do they need? I, I I know it's America, right? It's get what you can, and if you have the the ability to do it. But how much more before they separate so far that there really is no competition? Well, you know we're uh, we're we're getting to the point to where the the gap is so wide that maybe the competition on the field. Um, Will, will not continue between everybody. Uh, it, it does feel like we're getting close to that point. And when I mean close, I mean within, you know, the next iteration. Maybe it's not here yet, but, you know, we're talking about a six-year deal and extension with ESPN that would run through 2031. Well, you know, beyond that, the next iteration, um, and, and I, I wrote about this a few weeks ago, let's just take the G5. The gap between the G5 and the P4 is growing steadily and NIL has been a big contributor to that. And with the CFP revenue distribution figures, the gap will continue to grow. 
between those two groups and you wonder how long they can compete together, let alone, you know, the, the two Big 12 and ACC staying competitive with the SEC in Big 10. I think the next iteration, um, there's a lot of people in the G5 that, that believe that they should do their own thing uh, mm-hmm. because the competition is, is getting where it's so harder to compete. You know, the G5 has been somewhat weakened with realignment. All their top teams are, a lot of their top teams are gone. Um, you know, the Cincinnati's, UCF's, Houston's, uh, off to the Big 12. And so you, you do, you do wonder, um, about that gap. And then you look at the other gap, like we've been talking about between the P2 and the other two. And, and you wonder how long that can continue, especially when, as you said, um, You'll, you'll have that growing revenue gap. And it's why teams like Florida State, right, and maybe Clemson and North Carolina uh, have examined look getting out of the ACC, uh, thinking that that's long-term, you know, 10-plus years down the road, that's not the place. They're not going to be playing the same game. Um, and, and I think when you look at the revenues, which you talked about, the media rights deal, which I believe at the end of all the contracts or so, you know, seven to eight years from now, I believe the, the numbers are, you know, ACC would be making around low 50s each ACC school. Big 12 is, is more in the, I think, high 40s, maybe low, maybe around the same, you know, around around 50, either one of them. And the Big 10 and SEC and media deals will make it in the mid to high 90s, I think is the latest projection. Then you add, as you mentioned, right, the CFP figures. Each SEC school in this proposal will get $23 million a year. That is a roughly $10 million more mm-hmm. than what the Big 12 schools will get. Uh, and, and imagine that over time. Uh, it certainly wears down and comes a point where you say, throw up your hands, right, and say, well, there's no more competition here. Ross, this is a, a total what if, and, and who really knows, but uh, as best I guess as you can guesstimate, had the Pac 12 been able to finagle a TV deal a bit earlier, or everybody would have guessed just been a, a lot more patient, or a little bit more patient, they were a lot patient, but a little bit more patient. Is this conversation still basically happening as is, or would that have put a roadblock you think that prevents this conversation? Or was this all inevitable to begin with, or was that like the final straw that breaks the camel's back, so to speak? Well, you, you you know you can point to a lot of things, right? You can point to um, to me. There were three big waves of realignment that land that resulted in our current situation, um, and that is Oklahoma and Texas obviously leaving for the SEC, USC and UCLA um, leaving for the Big Ten, and then of course this past August you know, with the implosion of the Pac-12. If the Pac-12 were still in existence uh, with without USC and UCLA, I think a similar conversation to now would be would be happening. Still, it wouldn't probably be as extreme. I don't think if you had a fifth power league that the SEC and Big Ten would combine for fifty eight percent of the base revenue, you know, under the right. current proposal, but. Maybe it's you know fifty percent or forty eight percent or something like that. It would still be high, uh, but I, I do think you would still have a similar conversation. You just the conversation, the gaps, you know, would be would be smaller uh, between the between the conferences and between the among the schools. The gaps uh, would be a little smaller, probably. But in the end, I don't know how long. You know, as soon as look, as soon as USC and U- UCLA left the Pac-12. It was kind of the end um, because that league, even if they got a new deal, it would have been a short deal. Uh, eventually, what we're seeing happen with the consolidation of the most valuable and big brands is or was going to happen. Like this was mm-hmm. going to happen eventually. Um, it, and uh, you know, I think it's done. Obviously, you have the ACC. Um, uh, that's breaking apart in a way or might break apart in a way, just like the Pac-12 as well. Ross, as always, man, uh, love watching. Whenever you pop something up on the Twitter feed or what you have on Yahoo Sports Online, appreciate the time you, you, you give us. Great job, and we'll see if, what that deadline might be, and hopefully there is some kind of uh, at least something new to grab onto and move forward. 
by the end of the week. Ross Dellinger, Yahoo Sports, with us on 365 Sports. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of good stuff there from Ross to to talk about, chew on, and think about. But uh, certainly that deadline, I know what Brett Daniels said in, in an official capacity, but there is a there, – there, you need something to happen here pretty soon. It may not be like, hey, Friday it has to happen, but you can't also like kick it down another three months, four months, five months. I mean, there has to be a, a deadline of sorts. So, yeah, sooner the better – that they can get that all resolved. And, yeah, I mean, what did y'all think? I think it I, – I wanted to throw that pack thing in there because I've seen a lot of retconning of what happened over the last year of, like, well, it's the Big 12's fault that every – it's like, be please. I'll, I'll say it as yeah. nicely as possible. Like, be please. Um, that is not how that all worked and not how it would be working right now as though everybody would have just sat and, oh, no, we're perfectly happy here. We're going to watch the, the gap – I mean – this is all happening, whether on a, a faster timeline or a slower timeline. It was happening, uh, this consolidation, as Ross pointed out. So I'm glad that we got his thoughts there at the end on, on that part of the puzzle. But, uh, yeah, it's it's a lot to digest and a lot to figure out and a lot of politics. Uh, Paul is a political fan yourself, me not being one whatsoever. Um, this is fascinating in a it way. Is, it I is, mean, it, because it is – you see people try to, like, whip votes or threaten things, you know, and – um, you know, this is maybe a little more old school than it is now because, like, now it's just subterfuge and yeah. nonsense. But social media ploys, yeah, and, yeah, all those things. But what this is is knowing that there's going to be a deal done because there's no way around it. Like they're they're trying to throw out what they can and and, and use whatever platform they can and say, well, oh, I mean, we we bring in more money and we spend more money. Well, yeah, but like that also has to do with the fact that you know you guys you know, banded together kind of at the right time. Like, you know, that you're kind of aware of your foresight, but there's also some people there that have not really been helping you out in that regard and just happen to be there. And I do think that that's part of it. And that, I'm not knocking those. Like, I'm not knocking the Vanderbilts and Rutgers of the world and Maryland who happen to be in the right place at the right better time. Better be lucky than good. Like, yeah. Better be lucky than good. But I do think that that drives a lot of, like, if you're Kansas State, Clemson, Florida State, like, teams that have been, like, right. regularly competing for, you know, National titles, like in Kansas State, has been close but never gotten there. Like over the last twenty-five years, several times. You know, if you are, uh, if you're Baylor, if you're TCU, if you're one of those teams in the Big Twelve and the ACC who's gotten up close, and you've you've seen a team like Vanderbilt, Rutgers, or whoever, Purdue, like just kind of be there, you're gonna be like, well, I mean, I get it that they're in this league, but I mean, people like us more than they like them. Yeah, the commitment so, like, level's different. So why yeah. is like why do we why are we getting less money because thirty years ago we made a decision when things were different? Like, let's talk about this. Yeah. And I, and of course, I'm of the belief that you should spread the money out a little bit more evenly and then yeah. a reward for performance down the line across all of college. Like if everybody's giving the same league, let's make the like one TV deal. I know that's not how it works and that's really pie in the sky nonsense, but that's the only thing that can really solve this because otherwise you just get further and further separation yeah. because now because the sec and the big 10, they're all corporations, but the sec and the big 10 are like, Amazon and Facebook, like they're just so big, yeah. you're not going to stop them. Right. So like they're just going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing the limits until they are there. Yeah, I think the the thing is, is it's one thing to say, hey, we deserve to make more money. Okay, I'm not sure that I really feel like the – I mean, I think Ross laid out a great – you know, set of uh, reasons as to why there could be different ways to do this, but for some reason they're stuck on this one way of, of kind of going about it. But as far as the, the money distribution goes, I, I wish they would maybe listen to that interview and um, have some different types of conversations about that because it's, it's one thing like, hey, uh, you deserve – a bit more because you bring more ratings or whatever. But if this is like when you get every single box in your favor, the gap is so large because it's everything. I mean, it's it's the access, it's the money, it's the it's the every single part is in your favor, and that's the thing that you just yeah you have to eventually fight back. And if you lose that fight, then so be it. But what are the alternatives? Uh, because otherwise, you're just you're in a situation where there's absolutely you know no advantages in your favor. Um, and yeah, I mean, you just can't just take it all and just accept it. You've got to push back a little bit. Only because we're a mile away from a stadium that was over $300 million. We're less than a mile away from a pavilion that just launched this year that cost millions of dollars. Every school right now that's a part of the ACC and the Big 12 in some way, rebuilding, renovating, or adding all these facilities because of money that they're getting 
from the TV money. And yes, I know Texas Tech's doing their stadium again, and there's donors and funding and all that. Uh, if all of a sudden that was to dry up, it would be interesting to see what would be of those stadiums in the next 8 to 10 or 12 years. we got to take a break. Ashley Hodge is up next to discuss the Big 12 men's basketball tournament starting this week in Kansas City. Uh, this is 365 Sports. Richard Carr, Buick GMC Cadillac. They are the people that you can count on. They're the people that thousands of folks from Central Texas and other areas have counted on over the last 20 plus years to get their vehicle fixed up, to get into a new vehicle, to get into a pre-owned vehicle. Well, they have all of those options for you right now over at Richard Carr as they are celebrating 25 years of business this month here in Waco to celebrate their offering mad savings all month of March long. Save thousands on a GMC Sierra SLT crew cab. Uh, the new GMC's uh, qualified buyers can get 1.9% financing for 72 months. And if you're a military or first responder, well, you can also save an additional $500 on the GMC Sierra SLT crew cabs. Check those out right now over at Richard Carr. Plus, you can also get a 65-inch 4K TV here in the month of March, not only because they're celebrating uh, their anniversary but also it is the mad month of march of course but uh 4k 65 inch tv can be yours with a car or truck purchase during this anniversary event so not only can you get a 65 inch 4k tv but you can also take advantage of all of those big savings on over 90 highly inspected used cars and trucks as well if you're not looking to go the pre-owned route and 100 credit approval is always their goal as they say yes when others say no so whether you're looking to buy new or pre-owned for 25 years in central texas richard Carr has built a reputation as the people you can count on for your automotive needs log on to richardcar.com today or go see them now and celebrate their 25th anniversary with big savings and get yourself into a new or pre-owned ride of your choosing highway 6 the imperial exit Samantha Duvall, TexasBeefHouse.com with me, David Smoke. And tell you what, you guys keep rolling along. You do have yet another date, correct, for an online and live auction. Yes, our next online and live auction will be Thursday, April 25th. We've discussed how this has been unique and how people have reacted to it. Has that momentum continued as you've done more? Yes, it's kind of half and half. We'll have a good amount of people there that are from the area. And then we have probably 40% that that we ship out and everybody that I've delivered locally to has talked about how much fun they had and they want to know when the next one's going to be. We've gotten great feedback from the people that we've shipped to. They're all just so excited about this event and they can't wait for the next one to happen. Premium grade East Texas beef. Customers don't have to go out and buy their beef. TexasBeefHouse.com from their family and their ranch to your plate. TexasBeefHouse.com Automatic Chef Canteen is a full-service micro-market vending and office coffee provider with state-of-the-art vending equipment, a wide variety of products, and offering custom-fitted micro-market vending office coffee solutions for your employee break room. You want a full break room solution and a workplace oasis? Well, Automatic Chef Canteen, locally owned and operated for over 50 years in Central Texas, also includes in-house mechanics on call 24-7 for fast, reliable service and maintenance. Automatic Chef Canteen, 6900 Imperial Drive in Waco or online at automaticchefcanteen.com. Our good friend Brad Boozer, Boozer's Jewelers here at 365 Sports. Now, Brad, uh, people who watch uh, and listen to our show know I'm a double-time customer for you, engagement ring and wedding band, and you guys do that great, but that's not all you do at Boozer's Jewelers. Absolutely. And uh, I always like to say, you know, it's a new year. It's a great way to start the year out. Uh, go through your old jewelry, go through your wife's jewelry box, go through anything you're maybe not wearing, something that's broken, something that you're not using. We do a a massive amount of custom work. We can take your old jewelry, old diamonds, old watches, and we can convert it into something special for you and make a one-of-a-kind piece of jewelry. Uh, and if that's not something you're interested in, uh, a great thing is we can turn that into cash. So we buy gold, we buy diamonds, we'll buy Rolex watches, any kind of heirloom jewelry, anything that's maybe passed down to you. Boozer's Jewelers, where do they find you, Brad? We're at 1025 North Valley Mills Drive, right on the corner of Lake Air Drive and Valley Mills with the big clock on the corner. This is 365 Sports, powered by Sikkim365.com. Enjoying the show? Hit the like button and subscribe. 
This segment with Ashley Hodge of Sikkim365.com and 365 Sports, brought to you by Richard Carr Motors, the Baylor Bear Hotline, as we discuss Baylor and really the rest of the Big 12 as the tournament starts here in a day or two in Kansas City. Ashley, thanks for your time as always. How many teams in the Big 12? Nine look like they'll get in. But of those nine, how many of them are schizophrenic or um, bipolar in a way like Baylor can be, like Texas can be, and like a couple of other teams can be? Yeah, I would say that, you know, probably you could probably put seven of those nine in that category. The league is so good that um, the only consistent teams this year in league play have been Iowa State and Houston. And then Iowa State, you know, drops a game against Kansas State, a game that they were expecting to win uh, for their season finale in, in, non- in, in conference play. Houston's been the only really consistent team from start to finish. Uh, you know, Kansas uh, miraculously went 15-1 and one at home, but uh, I think they were like 3-7 and seven on the road or something like that. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't a great uh, road record for the Jayhawks. Uh, so I, I think all the teams have proven that they're – vulnerable against the right opponent uh houston is is the one that looks obviously like they have a uh you know a real good shot at making the final four actually uh, at this point for baylor is it less about the seed which is probably a three and more about the draw that they get yeah i would agree with that i i still think there's a possibility that they'll get a two seed they they would have been in the driver's seat for that if they had beaten Texas Tech in Lubbock. But, I mean, you look at their resume, miraculously outside of the big three at the top of the rankings, Houston, Purdue, and UConn, who all have uh, 11-plus quad one wins and only three quad one losses and and no losses outside of uh, quad one, Baylor's resume stacks up really well. They have the fourth most quad one wins with nine. You know, I'm just looking at their non-conference schedule. looks like six of the teams they played in the non-conference might make the tournament. Cornell's the one that's uh, kind of on the fence. But, you know, Seton Hall, Auburn, Duke, Michigan State, um, Florida are all uh, tournament teams. And, and they beat, uh, you know, three of those teams. And, and, you know, maybe if Cornell makes it, that's a fourth. So I, I think their resume stacks up really well. You look at, you know, Iowa State and Texas Tech and, and Texas and TCU, they have pretty thin non-conference resumes. Um, obviously, you're competing uh, maybe only against Iowa State for a two seed, but uh, that Iowa State Baylor game may may be a, a pivotal game to determine who gets a two seed in, in the tournament. They got to put somebody on that line, and and uh, outside of those three that I mentioned earlier, UConn, Purdue, and Houston, no one's really separating themselves uh, from the rest of the pack. Ashley, I think everybody knew that this wasn't going to be exactly like football as far as the new teams coming in and having maybe a little bit of a struggle early on. We knew Houston was going to be good. It was just a matter of how good would they be. And they've been building and building for years, just you know, three years ago, meeting Baylor in the Final Four, and, and Baylor wins the title. But uh, how surprised or, or maybe what has stood out to you about Houston this season, first year in the Big 12? Well, they have the best point guard in the nation by, by, by a wide <laughs> stretch. I mean, yeah. that, that helps. I mean, we saw that with Baylor when Baylor had Davion Mitchell. Mm-hmm. They have a Davion Mitchell-like point guard. And uh, when you got a guy that can just lock up the other team's best player and can make plays down the stretch and, you know, can really make everyone on his team better, that's a huge advantage. You know, obviously, Criers played well for them, Roberts, um, They've got some other dudes. Uh, they got a lot of, you know, they got a great team, but uh, they, you know, having the best point guard in the nation is a good start. So, um, Ashley, the tournament is about to begin in Kansas City. There's nobody unless they, like Oklahoma State or West Virginia, shocked the world. Who would be the first team out of the Big 12? Oh, as far as, well, I think Kansas State um, right. is, is in. They're a already, perilous po- yeah. position. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they'll have to at least make the final, I would think. Um, yeah. Oklahoma did some good work in the non conference. So I, I think they're, you know, probably in the field. You know, TCU's one that, that's got to be a little nervous. You, you wouldn't want to lose your first game if you're TCU. Uh, so, so the loser of that Oklahoma TCU game might be feeling a little bit nervous uh, come selection Sunday. Cincinnati's a team that's interesting to me. You know, they're they're um, 
I just think, you know, they're probably going to beat Kansas. If, if you don't have Hunter Dickinson and McCuller, uh, you know, if they're able to beat West Virginia and then, you know, beat Kansas and then, you know, Baylor, that's a, that's a tough matchup for Baylor. Uh, they're, they're, they're gritty, you know, so if they're able to make a run and, you know, maybe get to the final, then maybe there's uh, a better case for them. But, but I, but I think for the most part, you know, you're looking at, uh, you know, Kansas State's the one that you, you want to watch, uh, you know, as far as having a chance to make the get in the field. Ashley, do you think Baylor's season is much different if LJ Cryer doesn't leave? No, I, I don't. I, I, I mean, LJ is a great player, mm-hmm. um, one of the best shooters in the country. But I mean, if you're looking at, you know, Jaden Nunn or, or LJ Cryer, I don't see a whole lot of difference between them. I, I, I think Jaden Nunn plays a little bit better defense. Um, LJ is probably a little more consistent on the offensive end. What makes LJ so good is is having Jamal Shedd, you know, take all the, the the ball pressure. If Jamal Shedd gets injured tomorrow and LJ Cryer has to run point, I don't think Houston's going to feel good about their their chances to to advance far in the tournament. Um, you know, I think I think uh, Baylor, you know, it's a wash, uh, and and I think obviously Jaden Nunn probably is better for the future. So um, I'm I'm okay with that trade off. Jacoby Walter, freshman of the year. Ashley, a lot of hype for him coming in, and he's been a joy to watch. But just your perspective on seeing a full regular season from him, what you hope to see uh, moving forward as well? Yeah, hopefully he and Eve take a big step up in the tournament and uh, we can get Langston Love back in the groove. I, you know, I think Scott said this in the post game with Texas Tech, and I believe it's true. You know, it, I think it was great for Baylor that L, uh, that Langston got a game under his belt against Texas Tech, and then we'll get another one, at least one in the Big Twelve tournament, hopefully multiple games, because uh, you want to get him back in the in the rhythm, in the flow. And I think you know other teams that have had players returning from injury, like the uh, Washington for Texas Tech, uh, that's going to be a challenge. Uh, so to answer your question, you know, Jacoby's the type of player that once you get out of the uh, physicality of the big 12 i i think there's been a track record of referees calling it tighter in the ncaa tournament than that what they allow in the big 12 and the big 10 and uh if they if they follow that you know trend i think jacoby's gonna have a lot more freedom and and not you know be as uh physically at, at a disadvantage like a lot, a lot of freshmen are and we'll really have a chance to shine in the big dance then i think eve will be the same way um, those two are athletic and they're, you know, they play super hard and they, they play with a great motor. I, I think you can't ask more from freshmen than what they gave you this year. Ashley, what are your thoughts about Rodney Terry last year? You know, I mean, took over a bad situation, <laughs> took him to the elite eight. They were really good by the end and, and they were, they're dynamic at times this year. And then all of a sudden the Baylor in the second half and other teams really good in Lubbock started out well against Oklahoma but they, they are like a lot of teams. They seem to have these ups and downs. Do you think there's any question he'll be back for their first year in the SEC? I think he'll be back because um, I think they're going to make the tournament and it would be probably hard to fire him. You know, they got Trey Johnson coming in, so they got a, you know, premier uh, five-star freshman that's going to that's gonna be coming in for them. Although, you know, I, I do, I mean, I'll say this, I've never seen a guy care about what other people think more than, yeah. <laughs> more than that guy. Yeah. I mean, he's kind of gotten a reputation for being a whiner, um, you know, after the Baylor game, complaining about the officiating after they, what did they foul Baylor 15 times in the last two minutes? I mean, it, you know, it was lopsided because of that. I don't know. I think, I think he's, uh, you know, definitely not made any friends with some of his, uh, uh, whining behind the scenes that maybe not maybe people don't know as much about you know like the incident coming to Waco last year and then and then also uh his you know complaining about UCF and and the the downwards horns and you know just some things that have probably uh not endeared him to other coaches and other people in the league but you know what matters most is the alumni and the fans at Texas and I think they're kind of lukewarm on him. We'll, we'll see how he does next year, but I think we'll get another year. All right, man. Thank you for your time, Ashley. We appreciate it. Ashley Hodge, segment brought to you by Richard Carr Motors, Baylor Bear Hotline here on 365 Sports. We will get into a few of the NFL moves because of the legal tampering, as we discussed earlier today. Cowboys have lost a running back, but he was on his way out anyway. If, if it's tampering, no, it's not you know legal. What? The NFL is important, but we have to – 
discuss LSU and South Carolina women's basketball. We really do. Let's get into that in the next segment. Uh, we'll also today have King McClure, former Baylor basketball player, but now ESPN color analyst. But we got to get into this. Garrett Ross was all in it yesterday, mm-hmm. all over the uh, the push and the shove and the dropping and all the other stuff. We'll have that and also look at the NFL. And this is ESPN. Uh, excuse me. Good God. 365 Sports. Alan Samuels, Dodge Chrysler, Jeep Ram Fiat, Loop 340, east of 84 in Waco. Their lot is full. They have cars and what you want right now available. And, of course, the new discounts and also offers are available. Alan Samuels, Dodge Chrysler, Jeep Ram Fiat. Ted Teague late last week sent out uh, more copy uh, for what we could actually discuss when it comes to what they have. For example, right now, the Dodge Power Shot days are going on, where the thrill of the drive meets unbeatable savings. Feel the adrenaline as you conquer the road in a 2023 Dodge Durango RT, jaw-dropping $12,500 off. Unmatched performance, room for adventure. Dodge Durango ready to take your family outings to the next level. Summer is right around the corner. Unleash the power of the 2023 Dodge Charger RT, now available for remarkable $9,000 off. Feel the rush and pure performance. Dodge Power Shot Day is going on right now at Allen Samuels. Dodge Chrysler Jeep Ram Fiat Loop, 340 east of 84 in Waco. It was broad daylight. I stepped into a gas station for five minutes to grab a snack, and just like that, my car was broken into. They made out like a bandit. My laptop, my phone, everything. I called my agent to see what could be done, and he restored my faith in humanity. My claim was processed so quickly, and I was able to recover my losses. Stop by and see our agents at one of our three McLennan County locations. Coverage and discounts are subject to qualifications and policy terms and may vary by situation. Thank you for calling your local Marco's Pizza. We're turning up the heat with our new Reaper Cheesy Bread. Fresh, house-made dough is topped with a spicy cheese blend infused with jalapeno, habanero, and Carolina Reaper peppers. At only $5.99, this limited-time product is a hot deal. Add it to your order while you can. A Marco's team member will be with you shortly. Marco's Pizza. Pizza lovers get it. And that offer on the Reaper Cheesy Bread is available right now at any of the five Marco's Pizza locations in Waco, including Bell Mead, China Spring, Robin, in Woodway and Hewitt. Order online at Marcos.com. Call for a pickup or delivery. Marcos Pizza is turning up the heat with their all new Reaper cheesy bread with fresh hot house made dough topped with a spicy cheese blend infused with jalapeno, habanero, and Carolina Reaper peppers. And only $5.99 and for a limited time only. Marcos Pizza, the fastest growing pizza brand in America. Five locations in Waco and the new Reaper cheesy bread. Marcos Pizza. Pizza lovers get it. Established in 2007 and independently owned, Alliance Bank Central Texas is committed to helping families and businesses meet their financial goals. From their tellers to their board of directors, they know the importance of superior service and competitive products. Customers have confidence knowing that their financial needs are in good hands. It's your bank, Alliance Bank Central Texas, with two Waco locations, 4721 Bosque Boulevard and 191 Archway Drive on Highway 84 and at AllianceBankTexas.com. Member FDIC and Equal Housing Lender. Stepping into a new pair of boots is great, but stepping into the boots of a U.S. Army officer can also add confidence and leadership skills to your son or daughter's career path. There are more than 150 occupational specialties to help them find the best fit for their future. See all the things your son or daughter can achieve in our boots at GoArmy.com. U.S. Army Waco Recruiting Company, 254-598-8131 or 254-776-1543. This is 365 Sports. The Sikkim 365 app is brought to you by Alan Samuels Dodge Chrysler Jeep Ram Fiat. Come by, let's be friends. I was trying... To enjoy a rare round of golf yesterday afternoon when Garrett Ross blew up our phone about LSU and South Carolina women's basketball. Of course, Garrett 100% bleeds LSU purple and gold. Mm -hmm. Huge LSU basketball fan. And uh, so I was, a guy that's in the group 
who has connections to LSU basketball, asked me about, had I heard anything uh, on the score? I looked at my game cast. They're up six. Next thing you know, Garrett blows up my phone, and all hell broke loose in the SEC championship game. The brother of LSU guard, Flage Johnson, was arrested after jumping out of the stands, jumping on top of the scorer's table, over the scorer's table, as if he was going to do something like square up with a woman. And then I think maybe all of a sudden realized that Cordoso's like six foot seven, a pretty I, big woman. Yeah, maybe, but also he like, didn't look that I, threatening once he got on the court. No, I, but I also do think that, like, yeah, it's it's probably your reaction when your your family gets, you know, hit. I guess I don't know, but again, it you should. I'd be more concerned about going down there, making sure she wasn't because she did get trucked there, like that she she wasn't hurt, hurt, and then worried about getting it separated later. This was. He was arrested, charged with uh, assault and battery and disorderly conduct by Greenville, uh, South Carolina Police Department. Apparently, he also shoved or ran over somebody in the walking down towards the uh, scores table that was like a volunteer or something like that to get to the table to jump over it. Um, yeah, that's not the main story. The main story, though, is the actual yeah. fight that took place. Yeah. I mean, that's that's where the arrest comes from. I mean, get, that's a side effect of Can it. Can I finish, though? Yeah. yeah, no. I, sure, I, go I, ahead. No, no, so you had that drama, but now you have the best player on South Carolina, the national, uh, the, the uh, number one team in the country. She's going to miss the first playoff game or tournament game. No big deal. They beat LSU, and then, um, so what should have happened? Did, did they handle it right? What should have happened? Go ahead, Craig. No, go ahead. No, I, I like, I, I mean, you got to keep things from escalating. And it clearly it, it had, it was getting escalated when it happened. So I mean, I, I think they, they did the best they could. Um, I do know, I do think that this uh, stems from the fact that these two coaches do not like each other at all. They don't, they, they, this is, this is almost like, Jim Donnan and Phil Fulmer at this point where, you know, um, th there is so much tension between the two of them that it spills over. They don't like, e you know, they don't like playing each other. They don't like recruiting, all those things. Oh, I think they love playing each other. Well, they might love playing. Well, Kim clearly doesn't love it yet because she hadn't beat Don Staley since she's been in the league. So uh, those things boil over. And when you hear, like, Don Staley answered the questions as diplomatically as possible, and Kim was like, oh, she didn't do that to Angel Reese. Well, like, Kim, that's really probably the worst thing he could have said because people are going to take it a bunch of different ways, and who knows what she even meant by that, but, like, or what she was trying to do in diffusing this. But it's a bad look for, for all of them, and it, it stems with the fact that these two have a pretty big personal rivalry, and those things spill over to the teams. I mean, they do. Yeah. Like, you, um, they're you both, cannot... They're both competing to win another national yeah. title. And you cannot tell me that they are not using their personal rivalry to motivate the team. You know, I hate Mulkey. You know, I hate Don. You know, like, or maybe not even those words, but like, you know, we don't like each other. Let's stick it to them. And it gets goes and goes and goes. And eventually you have this thing. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't think it's the biggest tragedy in the world that there's a fracas at a basketball game uh, because it's happened before. But it, it's, a, it's a strange thing. Obviously, it happened in a women's game. It doesn't happen all that much, but... Heck, you know, playing intense, things are going to happen. Uh, I think it's totally fine, and it was great with the exception of, you know, family members trying to run on the court. I mean, in the heat of battle in a high-stakes game where you've got the arguably two best teams in the country, yeah, Kim hadn't beat South Carolina. She also got a national title without yeah. having to beat South Carolina, so who gives a damn? I mean, yeah. I'd rather have that than the SEC championship any day. But, yeah, I'm sure that – that grates her, so there's uh, that element to it. And Don Staley knows who her biggest threat is right now. Is I don't know the defending national champion who didn't need to beat you to win that title last year, uh, and in LSU and Kim Mulkey who you're competing head to head with. So yeah, there's all the elements for that to be, um, you know, Michigan Ohio State level of heated without just the necess like the the same type of you know long decades long history. But in terms of the, the here and the now, those are probably the two most well-known coaches or two of easily the most well-known coaches, two of the most well-known programs, some of the most well-known stars in the biggest league. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's all the chemical elements to make that combustible, especially in a heated game. And so Flojay Johnson getting into like how this all started, I mean, why her brother jumped on the court. I mean, she got an attitude and, you know, 
gave a little push off or, or I guess whatever. And, um, you know, South Carolina got testy and it, it got, uh, got a little crazy there between them. And so obviously Camilla Cardoso gets involved and she's, a uh, She's, I guess, the impetus to now, I guess, Flojay's brother feeling the need to run out on the court. Uh, you see everybody kind of scrambling, and there's the funny meme going around with the uh, the female official just kind of getting out of the way yep. there once it ramped up. And um, everybody, I think, is fortunate that they didn't get uglier. No family member needs to be running on the court. No. Like, I mean, we're talking about storming courts and all that. I don't have a problem with the scuffle. I don't have a problem with the ladies going at it to some extent. But nobody needs to be running on the court. I don't give a damn who you are. Your girl can handle herself, and there's plenty of other people out there, officials, coaches, other players, to keep this from getting crazy. So, um, yeah, that's that's totally off bounds. He deserved to get arrested. I mean, in that sense, I'm not, like, rooting for it, but I can understand that, and that needs to have a message sent of that's not going to be tolerated. So if it took an arrest to do that, then hopefully that did the trick, and we're not going to see anybody running out there. But, yeah, I thought it was – interesting i thought a game that otherwise i don't really have a i don't have anything invested in it uh got a lot <laughs> spicier and became more interesting and certainly was the kool-aid talk or water cooler talk on twitter yesterday there for a good while so i, I love the competitiveness i love the rivalry that's building there and i would love to see these two teams play for a national title my only text i sent about this yesterday was i think to another family member i just hope they play for the natty I, I just hope the one thing that does come out of that is they put them on opposite sides of the bracket to ensure yeah. that if they play again, they're playing for a national championship because, yeah. my God, what great TV that would be for the sport. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised that it got heated. I am surprised it, I guess, went to the extent that it did. But if it was the men, we wouldn't be blinking an eye about it. We not would just be all. like, this is, this is what go. happens. So I think that's maybe an attitude that needs to change is, yeah, the ladies can get feisty too, and they can scuffle and – and, yeah, it's no different than the men's game. That's that's kind of how I took it all. I think – and there is, at times, almost this wanting to shove women's sports in your mouth. Uh, and, and the way that ESPN has covered them is unlike anything else before because they've had stars, because the women's game is better. Not everyone agrees with that. A lot of people can't stand watching women's basketball. But when you have a Caitlin Clark with what she's doing, when you have this South Carolina and LSU and Angel Reese and others, uh, it's like <coughs> women's basketball is getting more attention now than ever before. Ever before. And then all of a sudden they do something that's competitive and people are like, oh, my God, clutch your pearls. No, man, they, they're going at it. Those two hate each other. The two teams hate each other. I, I thought uh, it was pretty cool. Don Staley mentioned that Flaugier – Johnson did come up to her and apologize for the situation. She really didn't do anything. She went to go grab the guard from uh, what from South Carolina who had the steal. Ended up being you know saving. Well, then she pushed off when but they were kind of. Then she pushed yeah. off. Yeah, it got it got. But golly, I I I, I thought it was pretty cool. I, now people can sit there and and um, question who said what in the post game. No one ever since I moved to Waco in 2010 has ever been a lightning rod for comments she's made that she probably shouldn't and comments that she'd made that she probably uh, was correct. But she just has a way, Kim Mulkey, has a way of lighting up, trending on Twitter for things. You know, remember the uh, back, um, what was the game? Where she said, you know, if anyone says anything bad about Baylor, you need to punch him in the face. I had to do a story, I had to do a cut in with ESPN over that. Be go, oh my God. So she does have a way of saying things, and a lot of times unfiltered, and a lot of times that's just who she is. And in this case, like you said, Craig, put them on the opposite sides of the bracket. And unless Caitlin Clark or somebody else, Ohio State or whoever gets in the way, let's see what happens. Yeah, I, I don't really think it's that big of a deal at all. Uh, I think maybe it's just people haven't seen girls squabble at all, so maybe that's the difference here. Uh, I don't know. I didn't pay attention to any of the supposed backlash or whatever. I, I think most of the people that I, I came across and what little time I spent um, – on there yesterday was just surprised because it's not something we see all that often. And, and yeah, a little bit of like excitement because it adds a layer to uh, the sport and to a particular game that maybe otherwise wasn't all that interesting to people, or maybe people didn't understand the, the appeal there outside of it just being two great teams. But now you add a little bit of that and maybe that does add into more ratings down the line for, for the game and the tournament. And, and if so, then, then that's great. But uh, yeah, I mean, you could feel something bubbling with these two teams just with how competitive it's been since Kim joined the SEC. Um, they're threats to one another and it's, it's competition at the highest level. So yeah, I don't, 
I don't want Flojay Johnson to get banned or I don't want to... Uh, you know, anybody else involved to, to get banned. I just want to make sure no family members are running on the court ever again. Yeah. And I think that was taken care of the way that it needed to be taken care of. So, yeah, I, let's see them. Let's see them meet up once again and, and see what kind of a game we can get out of it because that was a, a heck of a game as well. All right. So, again, Flojay uh, Flage Johnson's brother arrested, charged with assault, battery, et cetera. So what happens? You think he um, shows up at their next game they play in the NCAA tournament? <laughs> Who knows? I mean, yeah, but he probably is not sitting as close as he was, or, or if he is, then there's a security guard that's a lot closer than they were before because you just that's that's unacceptable. No, like there's no absolutely. excuse whatsoever for him jumping onto the court. She was not in any danger. She can clearly handle herself or feels that she can, and there's plenty of other people to handle that business. So I think that's the one thing everybody can agree on is like, yeah, that was crossing a line, but all the rest of it, I mean – it's not like there was any, you know, super malicious activity. It was just a scuffle on a basketball game. Again, if it was a couple of guys, we wouldn't even be talking about it probably. So um, I, I, I think it spices it up, and it, it, it adds an, a, a layer of interest, if anything, that uh, was there for people paying attention, but for those otherwise not knowing Staley, Mulkey, South Carolina, LSU, uh, that now, you know, it, it does pull them in uh, potentially as well, kind of like people hope that, that Caitlin Clark or has been doing the same or will continue to do the same. I don't know. I found it interesting, though, and um, and glad that it didn't get even further escalated uh, based on how it was handled. Garrett, did you go online and block Cardoso from your Twitter feed? <laughs> no, I thought it was hilarious. I wish honestly. they would have let Angel Reese go, too, by the way. I wish Mulkey would have let her go. Let's see well, what would have happened. That was right. the thing. It's like Smokey mentioned that Angel Reese is over there ducking out and going to the yeah. <laughs> When it all started, there's a video, a side video, that shows her walking backwards. She had yeah. tweaked her ankle, and everyone's kind of like doing this, and she's walking slowly back towards the bench. And when so when Kim said... I wish she would have gone after Angel Wish or shoved. Angel Reese was like in no mood yeah, right there at that time. She wasn't feeling great about it. And then she got on Twitter last night and said something about because of my status and how she had to defend herself or say what she said, whatever. It, it just makes for what will be fun to see a collision course perhaps in the NCAA oh, tournament. I'm sorry. I, I looked like I was checked out. We talked about women's basketball for a really long time. I know. I know. <laughs> you, you're always such a fan. Garrett, did you have any thoughts on it? No, I mean, I just I was flipping through channels, man. I saw Flo J go flying across the, my TV yeah. screen and paused and was like, okay. And I just wanted to see how everything uh, was handled with her brother coming out. That's what caught me. was exactly, like, dude, you got yeah. people jumping out. We had Jay Billis going off on this rant last week, <laughs> right. and then now it's this. He got his wish, though, right? Exactly. Uh, Flo's no brother way. got thrown in jail. Saying. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Of course, Stormer goes to jail. Jay Billis got exactly what he wanted. Well, let me but, do this. Yeah. Not storming the court, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we need to discuss Mr. Filipowski. Yep. Oh, he, uh, look, that's Who a move. Who almost lost his leg. That's a move. In the uh, court storming and may not have, like, lost his, and I'm, I'm, that was so ridiculous. Like the Caitlin Clark thing, too. And he's sitting there tripping North Carolina player, and then he says he didn't even know he was behind him. He basically glances at it. He knew exactly what was going well, on, he, and uh, that didn't get any enough it, attention no. at and all. He, and he got up and like tried to be like, oh, oh my sorry, God. Sorry. Yeah, well, also, look, dude, if you got a dead leg from that, that's what you deserve, at least, yeah, because you did it. in the shin. And, yeah, so, yeah, you got a little bit of a dead leg, but, yeah, you pull on the little, like, the Grayson Allen there, yeah, that, that's that's becoming too common of a Duke move. Yeah, no, it is. And, yeah. and that was interesting, especially since he seemed like he was uh, nearly uh, in the emergency room. Well, decapitated. After the, the court uh, you yeah. know. I mean, I'm used to watching goofy guys and, and you know big guys flop and, and act and do all of that in basketball at this point. That's, that's not a surprise. But what put me over, like, from having really – one, one minor opinion was just like, yeah, he clearly did that. And I immediately see, like, uh, you know, fans from Duke of like, well, you clearly missed the push like two uh, minutes before. And oh, like, yeah. and I'm like, I don't care. I don't care. I know what I saw about this one particular frame where he is very clearly tripping somebody. And we just left it at that. That'd be fine. But the fact that he wants to turn around and act as though that wasn't what was happening, it's like you're on camera, dude. Yeah. Like, you are very clearly trying to trip this guy. Don't lie about it. And the fact that people then back up that lie, it's just, it's like tribalism 
It's I like, get it yeah. to an extent, but it's like, come on, people. Like, just admit what your about dude that was a holding call in the second quarter. Just admit yeah. that your guy was a D bag for yeah. a second, okay? Yeah. And just demand better of him. Or, you know what, just roll with it. But don't sit there and lie when the evidence is right in front of everybody. That's what I can't stand. Is like, it's just so obvious that the fact that you doubled down on the lie is just like, what? I, I just can't wrap my head Look, around that. I can't not, wrap my head around that. You're not doing Kyle Filipowski any favors by letting him skate. Yeah, you're not because he's gonna. He you, took hardly any. He took some flare up, and that was it. Yeah. I don't know if anyone held him accountable in the post game or not, but like you said, Craig, he said he didn't know there was anyone behind. Come on, man. Well, then why we did you watched. like? How do you? Why, <laughs> why did you, did you raise up, your leg when you're like, about to you, pee on a? Yeah, fire exactly. Hydrant? Well, why are you getting up like that? Yeah. Like yeah. who? Who gets up by putting their leg out that yeah, way? I, I agree. I, and, like, oh, by the way, could have hurt himself. Which is an idiot move. Yeah. And then uh, what if the, the kid from Carolina falls, trips, twists his ankle? Oh, yeah, I mean, we can, what if it, yeah. we can what if it all day. Yeah. The bottom line is is that he was he tried to pull a dirty move. Everybody caught it in 4K, and then he tried to double down, or I don't know if double, but like lie about it in the post game and say he was trying to get up a certain – it's like, come on, dude, you're clearly lying. Everybody knows you're lying. You know you're lying. It is what it is. Let's move on from it. It's not a national scandal that we need to yeah. bog down on, but it's like, just be honest about it. You, you tried to be dirty for a second, and you got busted. I don't care what happened right before that. All right, Craig, someone wanted to know, uh, Paxton, what's the drink you have on your desk? Oh, I'm glad you asked, actually, because it's a gift from Garrett. And uh, for folks in Texas who uh, maybe grew up on uh, some old Houston H-Town Chopped and screwed, Swish a House, DJ Screw, that whole uh, era of music. Uh, Garrett got me a very cool and unexpected gift. It's Fat Pat Ghetto Dreams Pineapple Soda. And I don't know how good of a look you can get, but he was down in H-Town this weekend, apparently. And he also got me this little flyer of, uh, you went to Screwed Up Records and Tapes, which is the, the OG DJ Screw oh. spot. Um, and hey, I'm not doing a very good job with the cameras here. But he got me one of like the flyers of uh, of screwed up records where he went and visited and got me this soda that's a uh, yeah fat pat ghetto dreams pineapple soda so I don't think I'm gonna drink that I'm gonna hold on to this I, and and yeah. I don't know though what the the how much was it like a dollar sixty nine two dollar three dollars they were five dollars a piece wow and I wow. bought so many of them <laughs> yeah and did I did you, the same thing did you, you did. drink them no well that's what I, I don't know how long they stay. Them, yeah. But I'm going to have sand filled up in them, the there colors that match, and I'm going to have them assorted throughout. Yeah, that's a good idea. Because I bet I'd imagine the sugar probably keeps this good for a while, yeah. but after a while, I don't know if it like. That was, I, that look, was delicious. I have a. Well, there's we've got a full Dr. Pepper I brought in here. Yeah, that's uh, that's yeah, past this like <laughs> Remember, I had those Cowboys Doctor Diet Cokes yeah. bottles and water Coke. I've got some. I think I have empty ones. Yeah. But yeah, there's some like I don't Pineapple know what the soda. value is. Like, so, not not ha the, having the soda in it for every yeah year. I, I don't know but it's just it's very cool because I definitely grew up listening to Fat Pat quite a bit R I P Fat too. Pat gone I, way yeah. too no, don't don't even joke right now <laughs> <laughs> R I P Fat Pat gone way too soon um, and so that's a very cool gift Garrett I, I definitely appreciate it very no much problem. man I know you I, appreciate that I saw a video on online. You know, like a few years ago, like somebody who found like a case of Crystal Pepsi oh, and yeah. opened it, like opened one and drank one, and it was like still fine. No, it was oh, okay. <laughs> like they was like, oh, this yeah, is terrible. Yeah. Like, yeah, dude, it's like thirty year old soda. Yeah, so yeah. you say the soda is actually good. That one's really good. Um, Did you bring any back? Yeah, I've got like five of them at the house of different okay. kinds. I'm definitely holding on to the bottles. See if you can order them somehow online. or some way. Well, order it online and then maybe drink one and have the other one as uh, if you well, get it. Yeah, I've, I've tried that one. That one's really good. The Pokey Peach, Big Pokey, Pokey Peach, Peach R.I.P. Pokey. Uh, that was yeah. delicious as well. So every time you say a guy's name, it's R.I.P. Most that's, of them, uh, yeah. hip hop yeah. and Houston hip hop. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, two quick notes in the NFL. Saquon Barkley apparently is going to um, stay in the NFC East, but play at Philadelphia. Tony Pollard is headed to Tennessee. Uh, Cowboys running back, perhaps, with the Titans. I, I think uh, Tony Pollard in Tennessee is cool for him. I mean, he's from Memphis. His dad owns a barbecue restaurant there, which I would really, really like to try. Um, and, and, and apparently one of, the, one of the better ones. And there's some really good barbecue in Memphis. Paul, <laughs> stick to Tony Pollard. But, uh, but anyway, that's one sentence. Calm down. <laughs> God, <laughs> but, it all turns to food. Well, calm down. Cool your jets. No, uh, I think it'll be fine there. I don't know how Tennessee's going to be. They're rebuilding. Uh, he's going to be there with Ty J. Spears. Um, and then 
uh, of Saquon Barkley, the Eagles, Howie Roseman's the best GM. I'm not like one of these people who, who obsesses over free agency, but they tanked at the end of last year. And look, they just lost Fletcher Cox and Jason Kelsey to retirement, but they've already drafted those replacements knowing that that was coming. And the kid from Georgia. Kid, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Carter. I mean, of course, the two last kids yeah. from Georgia, really, the, the defensive tackles. And then, of course, they drafted the center from, I want to say, Cal or UCLA last year that is going to be the replacement for Jason Kelsey. And now, look, they DeAndre Swift was kind of okay for them. Well, what do you do to get better in a guy who's struggled because he's never played behind a real offensive line is Saquon Barkley. You bring him in with Jalen Hurts, that's going to be great for that offense. Uh, with the weapons that they have. Yeah, it, it's not to mention they also got Bryce Huff uh, from the Jets uh, who's going to help the pass rush. The Eagles are going to be good again because Howie Roseman is good, and the Cowboys got themselves in salary cap jail and are just watching the whole world walk by them. This is going to be a bad year for Dallas. I'm telling you right I now. I don't know why bad. Use, everyone uses his cap jail. It, you can figure it out. But they no, they go to cap jail because they put themselves in there. Cousins, they're like, they're like Taylor Kirk Cousins Swift. is going to get a hundred eighty million dollar deal. Jet with the lag Falcons. is a choice. Yeah, so is Cap Jam. No, that's true. That's a good point. That's a good. Yeah, point. and uh, what do the Cowboys still have to do? They've got to reorganize Dak's contract. They got to sign CD Lamb at some point. They've got uh, got to re-sign Michael Parsons again at some point, right? I mean, they've got like contracts coming up that are going to be. Is my is Parsons? Did they get that done already? I'm trying to remember. No. Okay. Yeah. So no. that's still they got Parsons and CD Lamb coming up. But they'll do that and gain space under the cap because of the way they structure. The yeah, contract. you say that though as though there isn't any sort of parameters whatsoever when there clearly are because otherwise they'd be signing people. Like I know, I know you can finagle it and you can get around it, but there is some element of you can't just do whatever you want because otherwise they is would. Is there anybody that signed today that they would have signed if they weren't in Cap Hill? Uh, I think Saquon Barkley. Mm. I mean, I do think that that is something like if they're really all in, like Jerry says, if they're all in then Saquon Barkley is a move you make when you have two free agent running backs and he's an upgrade over both of them. So that's a move you make if you're all in, especially if your uh, biggest rival in the division right now, who is the Eagles, no offense to Washington, New York, but the one who is constantly... There's no offense, that's reality. But it's reality. Like, look, I know that the old school is Washington and Dallas, but now it's, it's Dallas and Philly that runs running that division and are the ones that are the most successful. The Eagles were in the Super Bowl a couple years ago. They won one a couple years before that. And here they are getting better because they have a GM who knows what he's doing and is playing chess while you're playing checkers and you're just sitting there going, oh, well, I guess we're going to have to play Saquon Barkley twice a year still, you know? And then, okay, the, what about Austin Eckler, Derrick Henry? They're going to go somewhere else too. I mean, I, I would say, though, it's also day yeah. one of free agency. Yeah. Like, I do think Cowboys fans are freaking out a little bit for, like, six hours worth of activity or, I guess, 11 hours worth of activity whenever it started. Uh so, yeah, I mean, losing out on uh, possibly getting Saquon Barkley is not the end of the world. I think the Pollard thing is interesting not because of what they didn't do, but the fact that they went all in on this guy, basically. Yeah. They decided, like, all right, Zeke era's over. We're going Tony Pollard, and now they're they're not even sitting there with Tony Pollard anymore. It's kind of like their decision to go with Michael Gallup, uh, Michael, Gallup Michael Gallup over Amari Cooper in some ways, no? Yeah. Of, like, you bet on the wrong dude, clearly. Cooper's thriving. He has been since he left, and Gallup's on his way. <laughs> Way out eventually. I mean, yeah. and without having made nearly as, as much of an impact, um, you know. So I, I think it's it's more of a reaction to not having a splash of their own and also watching other people splash early. But and so there's there's that element. I, too. I would tell you from my perspective. And again, you you don't win the championships in free agency. You win them in the draft. Right. That's where you win them. You supplement and you maybe get over the line a hump a little bit. And I know we got to get King here in a sec. But I. This is not just a one-year thing. This is now about 20 years of not really doing free agency all that well and nothing coming of it and then being like, no, 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 we're going to stick to this plan. That's what I, I'm bothered by. That's what, like letting windows go by, letting Tony Romo's window go by and Jason Witten's and DeMarcus Ware's. And now you're l looking at a situation where if you don't help Dak out here in the short term either, his window's going to be gone too. Uh, Dorrance Armstrong? Yeah, that's Washington, a bad one. Tyler yeah. Biotis, who's, you know, you, you, they're pretty good about Pro drafting the offensive year, so line yeah. to Washington. Uh, obviously, with Dan Quinn there, that has a lot to do with that. Two teams out of 32 did not make a move so far today, and one of those, Dallas Cowboys. Mm -hmm. But, again, all in doesn't mean you have to do all the money, and sometimes the dumb money is spent on day one. When we come back, King McClure on the Big 12 tournament and 
Who does he see are some dark horses or surprises we might not think now when it comes to the NCAA tournament on 365 Sports? Cars price right, day and night. Average your car in Texas. Trucks will feel red, white, and blue. Average your car in Texas. Cars that zoom with lots of room. Average your car in Texas. Count on us, a dealer to trust. Average your car in Waco, Texas. One size fits all. That may be all right for an adjustable belt or cheap sunglasses. But when it comes to your financial needs, no one wants a one size fits all strategy. Cam Heathcott, your Edward Jones financial advisor, knows that his most important goals are yours. That's why we take the time to understand your needs, knowing you. That's how Edward Jones makes sense of investing. Cam Heathcott in Conroe at 936-756-7717. Edward Jones, member SIPC. Penny Clinic Men's Healthcare in Woodway is now proud to offer you men an exceptional weight management body sculpting product called semaglutide, also known as Ozempic or Wegovy. Semaglutide is an FDA approved weight management medication. Once a week injections of this powerful medication offers an average body fat weight loss of 20% within the first year of treatment. In addition to body sculpting, semaglutide also normalizes blood sugars and has the clinical research proof of reducing blood pressure, cholesterol, stroke, and heart attack risk. If you're like most men and you have stubborn fat that will just not respond to typical diets and exercise, then help us finally here. Semaglutide, affordable, highly effective, good Google search Petty Clinic Waco and reach out to the Petty Clinic team today for a free consultation with Dr. Petty to see if semaglutide is right for you. Go to PettyClinicLowT.com. Pizza, burgers, and Bears football. There's no place around Waco that serves them all other than Bubba's 33. Come show your green and gold and enjoy some of Waco's best food and beverages while watching your favorite team, the Bears. When real Bears fans get hungry, Bubba's 33 is the number one spot for ice-cold drinks, hand-stretched, stone-baked pizzas, and bacon-infused burgers. Join us for indoor or patio dining. Bubba's 33, Waco's restaurant and proud supporter of Baylor Bears football. Sick'em, Bears. This is 365 Sports, powered by Sikkim365.com. The 5 o'clock hour is brought to you by Edward Jones and financial advisor Cam Heathcott. Edward Jones, making sense of investing. Now here's David Smoke, Paul Catalina, and Craig Smoke. 533, it's the first day of the week, and also March Madness, the conference tournament, some last week, a lot this week, and then eventually Selection Sunday. King McClure, former Baylor guard and ESPN basketball analyst who has risen through the ranks as a basketball uh, television star. Thanks for your time, Kim, uh, King. Your thoughts about uh, the Big 12 has nine teams that are going to make the make the tournament. How many of those nine do you honestly think can make a run and get to the Final Four? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's a great question. The Big 12 has been undoubtedly the best league in uh, North College basketball all year when you look at it from top to bottom. Uh, but as far as teams going to the Final Four, this might be pretty interesting or a hot take, but I don't know if any team other than Baylor – and a non-biased opinion, any team other than Baylor can really uh, make a super deep Final Four uh, type of run. Because I think when you look at certain teams, you look at teams like Houston, I mean, defensively, you know how great they can be. Uh, but my question is, do they score the ball well enough? You get into a shootout with Kentucky. Can you score the ball at a, at a high enough rate to be able to win games? I mean, we know that Jamal Shedd was Big 12 player of the year. We know LJ Cryer was uh, he's been playing well, especially in the last five games. But also my other question is, my other concern is, um, when you're running against a different type of officiating crew, maybe a Pac-12 officiating crew or an ACC officiating crew, and they call the game a little bit differently, not as physical, and will you be able to adjust your style of play to be able to win that game? So I, I think when you look at complete teams who can play defense uh, decently enough, who can score the ball from the guard position, 
Um, I think that Baylor is the one team that comes to mind that actually has a chance uh, to make a deep run in the tournament. King, do you see a separation between some of the teams that could be one seed? I mean, I know you just mentioned Houston, but um, you know, like a UConn, a Purdue, that there might be a little separation in talent with them, maybe to to even the second tier down of the of the two seeds. Yeah, I think I think the UConn, when you look at top to bottom, is, is the best team in America. I think they have everything that you need in order to be successful. I mean, they're long, they're athletic. Tristan Newton, the six six point guard, Stephon Castle, probably a, a lottery pick. Uh, you have the inside presence in Donovan Klingon. Um, you have shooters. You have uh, a bench that can come in. They play defense. They can score the ball in multiple positions. I think that they're the best team in the country. And I, I personally wouldn't be surprised if they uh, repeat. The other team that I kind of like is Tennessee. I'm starting to like what I see out of Tennessee. I think Dalton Connect is solidified himself uh, as probably one of the premier players in college basketball. And if it wasn't for Zach Eady, I'd probably say Dalton Connect is National Player of the Year. The numbers that he's putting up are absolutely insane. I think it's about like 27 in the, in the last four or five games. He's been phenomenal. Um, Purdue, I don't necessarily trust Purdue uh, just because I don't I don't trust teams who play through the post uh, in March and in the tournament. I think we've seen that that's the rest of people were upset. Um, not with not just with Purdue, but any team who primarily throws the ball inside as their main uh, main offense. I think you have to have really good guards who can make plays. And the better your guards are, they can create off the balance and make everything easy for everybody else. I think that's what we see. They get you success in March. So I don't really trust Purdue, but I would say that UConn is starting to low key separate themselves. I think it was pretty clear, King, that Houston was very deserving of the all Big 12 accolades they got. But if not for the Cougs, then you could probably have seen Iowa State, at least a, a coach of the year, right? And TJ Otzelberger, they've had a fantastic year. Um, definitely more accolades potentially coming their way. Top 10 team right now. How much do you like the Cyclones moving forward? Yeah, I, I like Iowa State. I think that another coach you could have thrown in there was Cameron Kaplan. Yes. I mean, with Texas Tech finishing the way that they finished, they overachieved everybody's expectations. Um, but I think T.J. Altenberger has done a tremendous job. I did not think going into this year um, this team would be that good. I, mean, I saw them in the, in the non-conference, and when you look at the non-conference schedule, their defense was like top 10 in the country, but they didn't play anybody. They would be near everybody by 25, some games 30. So I thought it was a fluke. But then when conference rolled around, when you have a point guard like Taman Lipsy and Keyshawn Gilbert, the way that they share the ball with defense and the way that they can heat it up, it's almost very similar to what we saw in a uh, Davion Mitchell. They're not that level of defender, but it's very similar. The way that they can stay in front of the basketball, they pressure you, they speed you up. Ames Hilton is a hard place to go play at, um, but those guys have dudes who can go get it off the bounce they stay in the lane. They make the right decisions. They play well as a team. Monkeyla Bitch will probably be a first round draft pick. Not this year, but probably next year if he continues to develop. Um, I, I like what I saw out of them. Um, but I, do I have? Do they have enough to make a deep tournament? Right? I kind of don't think so, but I think that they will make some noise and they'll probably be a Sweet Sixteen team. King, who is, in your opinion, among the higher rated seeds, whether it's a one, two, maybe even a three, four, and you're talking 16, who is, to, in your opinion, uh, fragile? That, and yes, the officiating, where they play, who they play, the style of opponent they play, who might be fragile, in your opinion? I would have to go to Purdue. Just talk about styles of play. Uh, I'd have to go to Purdue. I think they're guards. You look at Braden Smith. Lance Jones, they got better. Lance Jones is a dude who got buckets last year when he transferred in. Um, but I still think Braden Smith, Braden Smith's numbers have improved, but I don't know if he is at the level where you need him to be in order in, in March to go get buckets when you need him to get buckets. Late shot clock guys, we like to call them. Um, so I would say that Purdue is fragile. I mean, that's the one team. If I'm a, number, if I'm a 16 seed, if I'm a 9 seed, like imagine they, right now they have TCU with a 9 seed. If I'm Jamie Dixon and I'm a nine seed and I win my first game in the second round, I have a Purdue. Oh, I'm licking my chops. I, I'm ready for that. I, I'm not. I'm not worried about anything. I'm going into that game expecting to win, to to, to make a run. And honestly, they have them as a nine seed. You might even have like a Tech as a nine seed or eight seed. I mean, some of these eight nine seeds in the Big Twelve. I know that they are. They, that that's probably the matchup that they would want to have. They would choose any of the four. 
King, how much pressure is on Matt Painter in this? Because he's had good teams the last few years that have made exits before everybody predicted them to, and it starts to build after a while. Yeah, I mean, one thing you can't say, I mean, the, the man is a great coach. He's a hell of a coach. So we can't say that, but you're right. I mean, the way that he's played as of recently, he's had really good players. He's had he's produced pros, produced NBA guys. But you're right. I mean, the, the fall in March, I, I think, is primarily due to throwing the ball inside. Zach Eady produces, so it's hard tonight to go away from him, especially when he's shooting over 60% from the field, averaging roughly around like 18 and like 13 or something like that, or maybe even higher than that. But it's hard to go away, but I just don't think that that is a successful style that wins you games. I don't know if we've seen a team in probably the last five years, maybe even before, uh, who's won a national championship and they threw the ball inside. I mean, last year's UConn team, um, they were they had guards who get to the paint. I mean, they had uh, my man who got drafted by the uh, completely blanking on his name, Jordan, 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 Jordan. I'm blanking on his name, but the shooter who got drafted in the first round, Jordan Hawkins, that's his name. Jordan Hawkins, Tristan Newton. I mean, they had guards who could go get it at a high level. So I think that you have to have elite guards in order to win. Um, so I, I think that Matt Painter, I, I wouldn't say like anything crazy, like his job is on the line or anything like that because he, he knows what he's doing. He's had success. But, I mean, eventually you, you're kind of like, hey, like something has to change. And so I, I think he'll figure it out. He's a great coach. All right, King. Uh, Baylor with a pretty good run at times, and yet they seem to be erratic they don't play both halves very well, but it's hard to do that. You played the game. You know that. You don't have the perfect game very often. But I'm, I'm concerned about they give up a lot of threes, uh, and they have this ability to, like, disappear for five minutes at a time. Isn't that the perfect resume to get knocked out by some hot Cinderella team? Yeah, 100%. I mean, I, I think that um, when I, the games that I've been, I think I've seen a lot, I've seen a lot of things who have had these cold stretches where they just can't score for four minutes. I, mean, I don't know what it is in college basketball, but I think uh, a few teams have these stretches where they just can't get a bucket. TCU is one of them. Um, but the thing that I love about Baylor is the fact that you have a guard like Ray J. Dennis, who at any moment can go score, can break somebody down off the dribble. Uh, Jacoby Walters is a guy who he's going to have to have a big mark. He's not one that's going to break you down and go get you a bucket. Um, but catch and shoot, making the game real simple, one dribble pull ups, he can do that. Um, I, I like the way that this Baylor team competes, and defensively, they're not great, but they're good enough. Um, but I would agree with you. I would say that um, they do have these stretches, these droughts where it's kind of hard to struggle, but I think that's when they have to rely heavily on Ray J. Dennis. And Ray J. Dennis has to step up, and he has to be an All American type of player for Baylor. King McClure. ESPN analyst with us. King, thanks for your time. King McClure with us on the eve of the Big 12 men's tournament. Women, of course, in the semifinals tonight with Iowa State waiting to see who plays for that particular championship. Most drip in the game, too, when it comes to uh, courtside attire. Oh, King? Yeah. Oh, he. Yeah. Get, hey, there was a note from Dustin Archambo. He also did a super chat. Is This is about the college football possibility of a separation to two to uh, what do you call it Craig super two super two is there anything Trademark. is there anything legally that can be done to stop the formation of a super league or what can be done to keep it fairish uh, for big 12 in the ACC I don't have any legal answer for you. Uh, I'm sure lawyers could could find something a little bit more up your alley as far as an answer goes. I know there's what like antitrust violations and things of that nature, but I saw, I saw somebody else point out in a tweet I just was kind of passing through. Um, it's always kind of been um, it's been part of the game, right? Like the antitrust and those kinds of issues. They've always navigated around those, and, and I think that uh, that that'd be another instance here where. Uh, I don't know the, the laws well enough, but I think at this point you're kind of barking up the wrong tree if you think that the SEC and the Big Ten don't have that already in mind if they were looking to pivot that direction. Um, but, yeah, I, I, a, legalese could, uh, a legal person could, could definitely explain that part of it a, a bit better um, as far as what action could be done. But based on what I've seen, there's not really much that you can do. I mean, even with like the antitrust stuff, it, it's just – College football, as an example, the way it's always operated has kind of shielded itself from that based on language and, and things. And so 
I don't know, Paul, do you have anything to add to that particular yeah, I, part? I, I would think that there's not a lot to get, like, again, antitrust stuff, but the antitrust stuff, they're all in together. That's right, the exa- other thing. Yeah, yeah. So, like, right now, college football is all in trying to avoid being all called an antitrust. And then if they start, if the ACC and Big 12 turn on the other ones, then they're like, well, then you're trying to do it. Yeah, I, I, there's not. Look, there's, right, just, yeah. there's just not. The only thing that can help them is the fact that they need to really look out and go, okay, if we're going to eliminate a part of the country and, you know, good teams from this list and, and whole swaths of people who aren't going to watch this now because they're they're not in this hunt, is that worth it in the long run or can we give back a little, whatever that is? I think that's the thing that's going to save them is common sense, less so much than, you know, antitrust or whatever. Yeah, yeah, I don't think there's anything legally that can really – be done because yeah you're operating under the same system and you've been operating that way for a long time now so why is this any different or unique than what has happened when the Pac-12 died or when yeah. you know so on and so forth so yeah there's no magic lawyer uh, spell that's going to solve any of the issues here um, as far as the Big 12 or the ACC go um, so that's to answer your your first question and um, also well, makes me wonder yeah. if the Big Ten and SEC are just doing all of this oh, for leverage. Should be comp- should we compromise? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, that's what's going on. Yeah, I mean they're they're negotiating. They're negotiating, and so yeah, I think eventually you hope that you land on a compromise. But my question about it is, I know that's what the Big Twelve hopes for. I know that's the ACC hopes for something a little bit better than what's been thrown out there publicly, like the massive gap in money, the automatic bids, all the things that would just tilt it in the other direction even more so. Um, but my question to that is what we started talking about at the very beginning of the show is, okay, if you're going to fight back, that's great, but what is your option mm-hmm. if that doesn't work out? Are you prepared to pivot and go a different direction and have an, an, your own setup of sorts? And the question, the, I guess the burning question is, does the SEC and Big Ten really care? Like when they talk about the college football ecosystem, do they really want the Big 12 and the ACC to be a part of this and others, G5s? Or are they hoping that the Big 12 and the ACC fight back? And with the ACC, again, it's hard because we don't even – like they're so unstable at the moment. Like it's not – it's a different conversation than the Big 12 because the Big 12 has who it has, and for the most part we know who they have, and that's going to be it. But the ACC is – it could – (laughs) <laughs> one move and that whole thing craters yeah. basically. So like that is not even operating on, on an entirely solid foundation right now. But if the SEC and the Big Ten want them truly to be a part of it, then I'm sure they'll find a compromise. But if the whole goal is we threw them a bone and they bit our hand, so screw them, that's the answer we wanted anyways, that's what you have to wonder if you're Brett Yormark. Uh, if they're offering a little bit, hoping you'll take a nibble, but really hoping deep down that you'll bite their hand and they can say, see, we, we did our best. You guys yeah. go do what you want to do then. We tried out to, to help you guys. And so that's that's the puzzle that you're trying to, I think, un, or that you're trying to solve right now if you're if you're the Big 12 and, and to an extent as well, the ACC. Well, yeah, then the, yeah, the ACC has the problem is they've got not everybody's happy. Like the Big right. 12, everybody right now is content, happy. You know, they're, they're fine. They need each other. Yeah. Um, for now. For now. <laughs> yeah. You know, but with the ACC – They've got one team that's very publicly mad, and they've got several others who are just letting that one be the asshole. Like that, I mean, right. I, t- for lack of a better term, like that's what they're letting Florida State do is go out there and be like, "We need more money. We're leaving. We're suing. We're doing this." And then you sit there and go, "All right, all right, all right, all right. Go do that." And then when they find out what they can do, then they're going to go like, "Well, we'd like to do that too." Now that we know that option's on the table, but we just don't want to look like jerks doing it. Uh, David Vincent, forty six thirteen. And sometimes the, the and we put the segments up on our three three sixty five sports YouTube channel. And I, I, maybe month, once a month, I'll go in there and look at some of the responses to a segment. This is the one we had about the possible breakaway. Why would anyone think the Big Two? It's super two to you. Care about any other conferences? That's ludicrous. And my response is, why does the NFL care about all 32 teams? Because you're as strong as your weakest link. And the SEC has been better than any conference in America in protecting their own from the beginning. That's why Vanderbilt's fine, Mississippi State's fine, South Carolina's fine, and that's why they'll always be fine. So use that same philosophy, except add more teams to the mix. Yeah, I mean, I kind of get what you're saying there, but... um 
why would they care about any other conference? I mean, because they actually do care about college football as a whole, resembling what it has always resembled, even if the gap between the has and the have nots is greater than it's ever been. And there's a clear separation. Um, but I don't think that they necessarily do care about that. I think they care about making money. And I do think that, uh, there is an element of wanting to be your own entity. So, I don't know. I, I don't think that they're really worried about the Big 12 or the ACC, and I've never been under that impression whatsoever, but that doesn't mean we don't talk about the possibilities because until those conferences cease to exist, they still matter. Maybe not to you in Starkville or you know wherever, but uh, they do matter to, I don't know, a lot of other people across the rest of the country outside the Southeast. So um, to what extent they matter to, to those two conferences, that's what we're going to find out here in the coming weeks and months because if they don't matter, then... We'll probably not see those teams playing alongside each other for very much longer. But do you care about the greater good, the country uh, as a whole when it comes to college football? If you do, then then maybe Sankey and and the rest of the crew decide that uh, everybody's going to continue playing together. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think that they care. I don't. I've never been under the impression that they do, no matter what word salad uh, Greg Sankey's throwing out there, or little, uh, what do you call it, like subliminal quotes and whatever that he throws out there that you have to, to – uh, figure out read what, between what, the yeah, lines. read between the lines on. So yeah, I, I don't think that, and uh, I know that's definitely the attitude of a lot of the fan bases. And so we'll see um, how much people care in the long run. But uh, right now, we're still all just wondering about it. All right, when we come back uh, again on this Monday, Paul Catalina's top five. It's time for Paul Catalina's top five. Brought to you by Texas Beef House. Where's the best beef in Texas? Your house when you order from Texas Beef House. Unleash the flavor of Texas raised Wagyu. From our pasture to your plate, TexasBeefHouse.com. Top five NFL free agency moves of hour one, day one. These are just the ones that happen in the first hour of free agency. When legal tampering uh, began. Uh, if it's legal, it's not tampering. Just going to throw that out there. So, number five, Bryce Huff to the Eagles. This one's going to fly under the radar of a lot of people because he's not a household name, especially when it comes to defensive ends. But he had the best pass rush success rate in the league last year for the Jets and Robert Sala, and he's joining a defensive line that has studs all over it. Now, no determination has been made by the Eagles on what they're going to do with Hassan Reddick. I tend to think they'll figure out, um, you know, who will be uh, like they'll figure all that out because that's just how it is. So if they have Hassan Reddick and Bryce Huff and Josh Sweat, along with the two defensive tackles from Georgia uh, that they've gotten the last couple of years, that's going to be a formidable defensive line. I think they brought back Brandon Graham, the old the old Wiley vet as well. Um, they need to do some some work on the back end of that defense, but they already started to do that. And of course, adding Saquon Barkley today, which we'll talk about in a second. But the Eagles made two of the best five moves so far today, at least in the in the hour. Brian Burns just got traded to the Giants, so that's a huge one. But Bryce up to the Eagles is big, even though he may fly under the radar a little bit. This is a guy who can get to the quarterback. Yeah, building a ferocious uh, attack defensively uh, as far as getting to the quarterback goes, adding him to the mix that they already had. That's, uh, that's crazy. They're going to be hell on wheels when it comes to putting pressure on, on the QB more so than they already were with a pickup like this. So, yeah, it's, it, they seem like they're having a banner day up there in Philadelphia, much the opposite of, of how you're – feeling and a lot of other Cowboys fans today and in the Seahawks too. see we're 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 in solidarity of what's going on uh number four Josh Jacobs to the Packers this means Aaron Jones now a free agent as they released him today um a younger guy uh really just a one-year deal with three Packer option years on the back end of it I would think if he's any good at all they're going to exercise at least one or two of those options for them but this is a guy who's younger who's been a little bit healthier than Aaron Jones although Aaron Jones has been a huge part of the Packers offense uh, Jordan Love has to be bummed that Aaron Jones is leaving but this is a good replacement and a big one and the Raiders kept, fought until the 11th hour to get him and they just couldn't do it uh, I, I'm more interested about the Aaron Jones aspect of this yeah. because man what a career he carved out for himself coming out of UTEP and uh, knew him because he's, he's a Texas guy, but, man, what a great career he had in Green Bay. Yep. Like, geez, Louise. And uh, they're a long time, super productive, but uh, he, you are a running back, and, and that in this day and age doesn't last forever, obviously. So, yeah, that, interesting to see Josh Jacobs move on from 
the Raiders. Uh, I remember not that long ago when he was like their, you know, a prize piece in the the buildup of the Raiders on their way to a Super Bowl, and now he's gone and. and not the blink of an eye, but it kind of feels that way in some ways. So, yeah, I guess it's a you know, solid, uh, younger addition for Green Bay, but I, I, Aaron Jones had a hell of a career up there at uh, Lambeau. The Cowboys should sign him just to not play him. Yes. Yeah. No, look, he'll, he'll – In that playoff game, he just seems like there's a little extra I, – I feel like he's going to be a giant tomorrow, and then I'm going to be like, oh, great, there's going to be two games. You know, great, I don't think he's going to – I think he's probably going to go chase rings. But that's what I would do if I were Aaron Jones. No, he's definitely going to get picked up. I mean, yeah. for the running back spot not being, like, the greatest position in the world any longer uh, and having not been for quite some time, like, he's he's had a long career, and he's definitely got some more tread left on the tires. But yeah. I get Green Bay's perspective here of just getting younger, and and I know Josh Jacobs is a super talented, you know, back. But, uh, yeah, I just uh, I think more about Aaron Jones with this move. Number three. Christian Wilkins to the Raiders. This one was huge. The Dolphins, a huge loss for the Dolphins, who are going to have to really work on their, their defensive line, who's, who has both defensive ends coming off of injury, and, and both of them late uh, as well, so may not have them for the start of the year, and now have lost their best defensive tackle to the Raiders. You put him next to Max Crosby. Lethal, lethal pass rush there uh, and run stuffing for the Raiders. Uh, and I'm very curious to see what the Raiders do. They also signed Gardner Minshew today, so... That guy's circus comes to Las Vegas, which I love Gardner Minshew unconditionally. Uh, so that should be fun to see if he winds up being the starter there, depending on what they do in the draft um, uh, and or trades. Maybe they get Justin Fields or something as well. I, I don't know. We'll see what happens with the Raiders and their quarterback. But Christian Wilkins on that defense uh, is going to be really good, especially since they've got to deal with the Kansas City Chiefs uh, twice a year. And having more uh, pressure up front is only a good thing for them. Yeah, I mean, he and Crosby ought to be a hellacious uh, tandem up front and massive deal, four years, $110 million. I know there's details to these types of deals, guaranteed money, all that kind of stuff, but that's a it's a giant deal for him. So, yeah, it's a really good pickup for Las Vegas, who uh, I guess is just hoping and praying that Antonio Pierce is really the guy to lead them to the promised land. But, yeah, they're getting active early on, so that's a team that's got a little bit of momentum just because of the, the location. Like, Does he sign with them if they're still the Oakland Raiders? For four years, $110 million probably, yeah. but I, I do wonder in free agency how much that's going to come into play of, hey, you also get to come play in Las well, Vegas. I, I think that uh, Mark Davis has more money. Like He's making more money with them being in Vegas than he was in Oakland personally, so I do think that they're more apt to open the purse strings a little, loosen the yeah. purse strings a little bit just because, you know, he's got this big new stadium and there's all these other things he can do and, you know, uh, even though he's still one of the cheaper dudes when it comes to free agency. They're, they're swinging big here. This was an effect of me getting a guy like this when you, you haven't had one like this for a while is, is pretty big. Mm -hmm. Number two, Saquon Barkley to the Eagles, and Apple will not let me type the word Saquon into an email or a text. It always comes out sequin. Uh, they need to learn it. <laughs> Apple needs yeah. to learn Saquon, and maybe they will now that he's in Philly, in the land of cheesesteaks, and going to be playing for a very good offense with a very good offensive line, something in his four- or five-year NFL career he has never done. He has never been behind a good offensive line. The Giants have not been able to build that up for him. He's still been a very effective and, and talented player when he's been healthy. And part of the reason maybe he wasn't healthy those couple of years is because he was getting hit a lot uh, when he wouldn't have normally. The Eagles, even so, even though they lost Jason Kelsey, you're still going to have a really good offensive line. Signed Landon Dickerson to a four-year extension. He's one of the better guards in the league, if not one of the best uh, guards in the league. I should have just... Said it at that. Howie Roseman pulling all the strings today and showing why he's the most aggressive and interesting GM in the league. And, uh, you know, the Cowboys just being like, listen, it's going to work eventually in these 25 years. We've, we're, we're, it's going to work, you know. Yeah, I mean, Saquon's a really solid player. Um, he's been around the NFL a lot longer, man. It feels like just yesterday he was the next big thing prospect-wise, yeah. and now he's heading like year seven or something at this point. This uh, is in year time. seven coming up, yeah. So, yeah, not the, not the most memorable tenure in New York just because they were never very good while he was there and he didn't have the best blocking, as you pointed out. But I'm, I'm excited to see what he can do rivalries aside uh as as a member of the eagles with a lot better talent around him and i know the eagles will have questions to answer like replacing jason kelsey for example but um yeah that that kind of spices up the saquon profile and makes him a little bit more interesting rather than looking back at another year in new york and you know going back to the drawing board with the giants so yeah i'm, I'm excited to see what this looks like he can catch it too oh, out I, of the backfield I, I, mean, he I like really it. really 
is a threat out the, of the backfield. Their center was not from UCLA. Uh, it's Cam Jurgens from Nebraska. Nebraska. So yeah. he is. And Saquon Barkley, other than the year he hurt himself badly early in the season, two games in, he's had no less than 41 catches in a game, twice above 50, and season. had 91 his rookie year. Yeah, because he's, he's very much a modern running back. You can do He's modern, old school. He's a nice – he can do a lot. He can do a ton. And the and the Giants just never never gave it around him. At number one, Kirk Cousins to the Falcons. Uh, the funniest tweet I saw about this, Kirk Cousins uh, has been very vocal about how he shops at Kohl's. He loves Kohl's. And the Falcons put out a tweet with the Google Maps of all the Kohl's <laughs> in the Atlanta area, <laughs> of which there are a ton, I a bet. ton in the greater Atlanta area. But Kirk Cousins signs to the Falcons. I'm going to give you guys a stat here. This is from Sharp Football, Warren Sharp. In 2012, he signed a standard rookie deal. 2016, $19.9 million fully guaranteed. 2017, $23.9 fully guaranteed. 2018, $84 million fully guaranteed. In 2020, $66 million fully guaranteed. In 2022, $35 million fully guaranteed. In 2024, $100 million fully guaranteed. In his career through 2027, he will have made $411 million, of which $329 million was fully guaranteed. He has one playoff win yep. in 12 years in the league. He is a, he's a stats compiler. Mm -hmm. He can at times put up huge numbers. But there's something about him that, to me, always seems like he's worried about getting hit. That a little bit skittish, and probably because of the teams he's played for. But he has put up a bunch of stats, but you don't see him win too many really big games. Uh, no, you don't. So if you're Atlanta, you're, you're maybe you're resigning yourself to that for a little bit, at least early on here. But uh, he's a major upgrade over what they've had. Yeah. So that's the biggest thing for Atlanta is, yeah, it co costs a pretty penny, but uh, your options, especially after this past season, um, I mean, you had to go out and spend money to go get a, a legit quarterback. Either that or you're going to do it through the draft, right? And mm -hmm. um, that's a, a bit more of a risky proposition than go ahead and just guaranteeing a bunch of money to a guy who you've got plenty of of, uh, of real-time stats and and. and you know, things that uh, he's accumulated over the years. So, yeah, he's a proven guy, proven that he can put up big numbers and win some games. Hasn't proven that he can win the biggest of games, but uh, he's definitely better than what they've had there for a while. So, yeah, that ought to be welcome news for Bijan Robinson and all the rest of the offensive weapons who have been kind of toiling away there in Atlanta here recently. Absolutely. So there you go. There's the top five. Uh, the biggest move of the day, though, might have superseded all those. Maybe not Saquon, but Brian. Nah, I'm going to say it, it's the biggest move. Brian Burns just got traded from the Panthers to the Giants for a second and a fifth round pick. Uh, the Giants had uh, two seconds in this year's draft, and they've got two fifths next year. So I'm, I don't know what if that's this year's draft or one of is from one of the other, but a big one and. Uh, a really good player in Brian Burns, who is, of course, a beloved Florida State. Seminars. I'm going to make um, Paul and anyone else uh, who's a Cowboys fan understand what Aaron Jones did against them in the in the four meetings. 83 carries, 488 yards, and nine touchdowns, including three against them back in January. He shredded them. Five yards per carry, nine touchdowns, and nearly 500 yards and four different appearances and the one the one in january was of course a playoff game all right emory winters dialing up 365 sports tonight tonight at 10 30 on the cw jack mckenzie levi caraway garrett ross back with a nice little pineapple drink for craig smoke from his uh trip to h down with the family craig smoke and paul catalina thanks to our sponsors austin eckler to the commanders Austin, I like him. Ooh, yeah. Tough, tough guy. And they've uh, they've got a couple pretty decent running backs. I don't know their contract status. Well, Brian Robinson is the one uh, there. Antonio Gibson went to the Patriots. So Brian Robinson and Austin Eckler in the backfield for the Commanders. I'm David Smoke. Thank you. Have a great night. 365 Sports.